what is salesforce.com it's a global cloud computing company founded by mark benioff in the year 1999 the company had this goal to offer crm on the cloud before i dive in let me explain what a crm is every company out there is selling a product or a service to manage the interactions with the customer the company needs a marketing team sales team and service team an application that can help manage all these processes is called a customer relationship management in short crm we can see the evolution of platforms over time in mid 20s we have ibm and in the late 20s we have sap and oracle dominate the market with client server architecture and right now we clearly see a migration to the cloud or the multi tenant architecture multi tenancy is an architecture where a single instance of software application serves multiple customers each customer is called a tenant tenants may be given the ability to customize some parts of the application multi tenancy can be economical because software development and maintenance costs are shared with broadband penetration being very high lots of companies are leveraging this technology let's look at ebay literally millions of individuals and companies are running their complete stores online and google which offers email and google docs for the enterprise where a single instance of the application is serving millions of users similarly salesforce offers on demand crm the on demand model has a lot of advantages available anywhere anytime as long as you're connected to the internet the platform is easily scalable you can add as many users as you want by purchasing additional licenses and periodic upgrades are rolled out automatically at any point in time every company using salesforce.com is running the latest version of the software and the pricing of salesforce is subscription based every user needs a license to log in the platform is pretty robust and can easily scale up to few thousands of users without hindering performance most of the infrastructure services like running the application servers web servers or making sure that the network is up supporting multiple operating systems database maintenance and disaster recovery are taken care by the service provider similarly the application services like providing security supporting multiple languages and multiple currencies providing an api for integration are also taken care by the service provider and lastly operation services like monitoring periodic upgrades backup are also taken care by the service provider if you ever worked as a complete stack developer responsible for building and maintaining the application you'll be able to appreciate the platform especially when the service provider takes care of infrastructure application services and operations there are a couple of standard applications that are offered by salesforce sales cloud service cloud and marketing cloud all these applications run on the force.com platform developers can also build custom applications on the force.com platform or even extend the functionality of standard applications There are more than hundred thousand customers using Salesforce. I have couple of them on the slide. They are present in pretty much every domain possible: telecom, IT, banking, consumer electronics, transportation, communication, automotive, and even non-profits. There are different roles on this platform. One could work as a developer, or an administrator, or a consultant. Salesforce has designed certification tracks for all these three roles. You have the developer track starting with Dev 401. In Dev 401, one would learn how to build an application using the force.com platform all the way from building your data model, business logic and the user interface. Managing data and building reports and dashboards are complementary. And there is no programming in Dev 401. Once you're comfortable with these concepts, you can take the dev 401 certification exam then you can move on to dev 501 in dev 501 one would learn the concepts of apex and visual force to tackle any business requirement that cannot be built using the declarative syntax using apex and visual force you can build any kind of complex functionality apex is a programming language used to build any kind of complex business logic and visual force which is a tag based language is used to build the ui Once you're comfortable with these concepts you can take the dev 501 certification exam and for the administrator track it starts with adm 201 one would learn best practices on how to set up configure support and marketing functionality on salesforce.com 
Advanced administration covers topics such as managing data, enhancing end-user productivity, and expanding Salesforce CRM to help you work more efficiently and get more from Salesforce CRM. And for the consultant track, you start with ADM201, like your administrator track, and then get into the Sales Cloud or the Service Cloud consultant role. Sales Cloud consultant role is focused on best practices of Sales Cloud implementation, and Service Cloud consultant role is focused on best practices of call center implementation. I take this approach of showing you how to build the application from scratch and introduce you to some advanced DEV501 programming concepts. If you understand and follow through all the course material, you should be able to easily pass the DEV401 certification. The best part, every user can sign up for a free developer account. In the next lecture, I should show you how to set up your developer account. Creating a developer account. You can create a developer account by going to developer.force.com and click on join now. You can pass in your credentials and create an account. You will then have to activate your account by clicking on the link sent to your email. Set up your password and your secret question and you're done. You now have a developer account for yourself to play with. When you first log into your own unique instance of Salesforce, also known as your org, you can get to the administrative setup by clicking on the setup link next to your name. After clicking the link, you're taken to the force.com setup homepage where you can start adding all the customizations you want. Here in the middle, you can see a link to the app wizard. This helps you create a few key components to get you started on building the application. Below the getting started wizard, there are recent items. Recent items are the things within your org that you worked on recently that you can click on to link back to. Below the recent items are my quick links. These are several links that most app builders and admins use very often. So they have been pulled out here as shortcuts. These are things like creating a new object or creating a new user or even creating a new profile. All these are different facets of app building and you can link to some of them here. Below the quick links is the community section. This is the area of the setup where you can turn to the community to ask for help. You can learn best practices or ask questions in the discussion boards or even post ideas if you think anything is missing from the platform that you would like to see. You can click on your name and settings. This is where you can add customization around your personal information and the settings for yourself when you log in. And now let me go back to the setup to talk about the left-hand side of the screen. Over here on the left, we have our setup tree. At the top of our setup tree is my administration setup. This is where you can not only manage users that are in your org, but also the permissions they have to view and edit data. You have more granular security over the fields that they can see and the different ways they can log in. You can also control things like email templates that are going out, maybe with workflow rules or approval processes. You can also manage data, import different objects and other files you may need. You can also export data if necessary. But I haven't gone over everything within this tree. And the tree definitely can be a little overwhelming. And that's when you can use the quick find at the top whenever you need to find something that you're not sure where to look. So for example, if you were trying to find the import wizard, all you need to do is type in import and you could see everywhere in the tree that this might come up. Then you would just be able to click on the link in order to use it. Below the administration is the build section. This is where you can make customizations around the apps within your org. Under customize, you can make changes to the standard objects. You can rename standard objects and change their labels as well. You can also create home page components that all users will see when they log in. This is also a place where you can make changes to things like chatter. Below that, you can see all the things you can create and customize. These are things like applications where you can create objects or tabs, and you can also create workflow rules and approval processes for your applications. If you wanted to add more programmatic aspects to your app, you could go under Develop. And this is where you can create things like classes, triggers, or even Visual Force pages. And outside of this, we have things like the Schema Builder, where you could build out your data model. 
or if you feel like you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you can go to the App Exchange and see different apps you might be able to install in your ROD here. And below the Build section, you have Deployment. This is where you have tools to deploy your application to different sandboxes or even to production. You can monitor all the different jobs in your org and different processes that are going on right now. From the system overview screen, you can see all the important data usage and limits for your organization. For example, in regards to my schema, I'm using four custom objects right now. Out of a total of 400, you can see how much data is being used in comparison to how much I'm allowed to use total. You can see the number of API requests made in the last 24 hours or all the different business logic that's currently running within your org. You can see how many tabs or Visual Force pages that you may have within your org as well as how many licenses you have right now. And you can also make your organization mobile using Salesforce One setup. On the right hand side, you have developer resources. And all these are links to things like articles or discussion boards that can help you figure out what you need to do within your org. There are links to featured content or events that are coming up within your area that are geared towards helping you with app development. Now I know that I've only touched the surface of all the things that you could do within the administration setup, but I hope that I've familiarized you a little bit with the layout of things and where you need to go in order to get your work done. It is very important to understand the different product offerings of Salesforce. There are three important ones, Sales Cloud, Service Cloud, and Marketing Cloud. Sales Cloud is an application that will help manage the complete sales process, all the way from starting a campaign, generating leads, converting leads into accounts and opportunities, and following up on the opportunity till a sale is made or lost to competition. You can also perform analytics by building reports and dashboards using the data. I can help you understand this better with an example. Imagine I have a small business to sell office furniture and we are using Sales Cloud to manage our sales process. I have the required inventory in my warehouse and I also have recruited a couple of sales reps to start selling our products. It is quite important to bring awareness about our products by starting some kind of campaign. I can use the sales application to document the campaign. I can create a new campaign, give it a name, like spring sale and we would like to spend money on Google AdWords instead of radio or TV. For some of you who are not familiar with Google AdWords, if I quickly search for office furniture, San Francisco, then I'm shown all these companies. When I click on these links, I'm routed to the respective online stores because these companies would have purchased these AdWords from Google. Even you can purchase AdWords from Google and have them display links to your website. Coming back, we are going to run this campaign for about a month in December. We expect to generate a revenue of 500,000. These are all just assumptions for now. We plan on spending $10,000 for our campaign. We might know the actual cost once we purchase AdWords from Google. Out of every 100 people who look at our ads, we expect 2% of them to inquire about our products. Let me give this campaign some description and save it. Once we start running a campaign, our potential customers find us on the web and call in to inquire about the product they are interested in. These potential customers are called leads. When a lead calls in, we could have a person responsible for taking the calls and creating the leads in the object. Maybe the first name, last name, and company the person is calling from their phone number, email, finally, what product they are interested in. And any special note. And the record is saved. Later, one of our sales reps can reach out to the lead. If the lead is interested in a product and wants more information about it like a physical demo or even a price quote, that means it is worth pursuing this lead. Then, this lead is converted to an account. When you convert a lead, Salesforce creates a new account with the name of the company. Optionally, an opportunity can also be created. Since a potential customer is interested in buying 200 office chairs, 
I'll call this opportunity 200 office chairs. I can choose to assign the task to someone if needed. I'll skip that for now and convert my lead. And behind the scene, a contact record is created with the name of the lead. This is the account that I just created. You can also see the related contact and the related opportunity. All these three objects, account, contact, and opportunity, are related to each other. Accounts are usually the names of companies who are your customers. Opportunities are nothing but your potential means to sell and make money. If another person from the same company wants to buy more products, then you don't have to create another account. You can create a new contact and a new opportunity under the same account. The sales rep tries to make progress on the sale. Every time there is progress made, the stage of the opportunity is updated. And any interaction with the customer, including a phone call, is kept track in the activity history. For example, if the sales rep talked to the customer, the summary of the conversation is captured in the activity log. This really comes in handy. Just in case the sales rep working on this opportunity is on leave, another person should be able to quickly pull up the opportunity and understand what's going on without having to ask the customer. You can also document who your competitors are and who your partners are. You can also add attachments to this opportunity if required. As the sale progresses, the stage is updated. Finally, the opportunity is won or lost to competition. All this interaction was with respect to one sale. But in real time, there could be many interactions happening within the company. You could also build reports and dashboards on top of these interactions. You can think of all these objects as templates. You can use them only if required. You can create custom objects, fields, or rename existing fields if you need to. You can even customize them to meet your business process requirements. You can also build workflows and approval processes in your application. Let me now talk about the Service Cloud. Service Cloud is an application that can help manage a call center. When a customer calls in with respect to a product or service, the application lets you create cases, assist customers with solutions, and the application can be completely customized to meet the business requirements. Let me give you an example. Dell is a company that sells computers and other electronics. A customer bought a Dell laptop, and when they have a problem, they call the 1-800 number. The support agent takes the call to find out the issue. The agent can pull out the customer information based on the account or contact, and then create a case with some description. And the agent can look up to the solutions object to find out if there is any solution that exists. The solution object is pre-populated with all the solutions beforehand. He can quickly look at the solution, troubleshoot the issue, and close the case. You can also configure and customize workflows and approvals based on your business process. And you can also build reports and dashboards to understand things like who are the top five support agents who solve the most number of cases or even average time taken to solve a case, etc. There is also a nice communication tool called Chatter. Chatter is like Twitter, but within the company. You can send messages to other people. You can also follow others, create groups, share files, conduct polls, and also use it for private messaging. Let me give you an example of how Chatter can be used in sales scenario. I am the sales rep trying to work on an opportunity. I need my manager Jack's approval on the quote and I also need some help from Susie who is our support engineer. I can message Jack and Susie right from Chatter. Jack, I need your approval on the quote. Susie, I need help with some documentation on the installation procedure. Now, Susie can quickly reply me right within Chatter and also share attachments that I've asked for. Any other user can also quickly follow this conversation. All this without any email. 
In a call center scenario, in solving complex cases, multiple support agents can seamlessly collaborate using Chatter and solve cases faster. Chatter has potential to replace internal email within companies. Chatter is tightly integrated with sales and service cloud applications. Let me talk about marketing cloud. Every company out there has presence on social media. Let me give you this example of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola has a Facebook page, a Twitter handle, and also a LinkedIn page. Customers tend to like products or even tweet about them. And companies would really like to understand what customers think about their brand or newly launched product. Using Marketing Cloud, you can set up listening tools to gather insights about your brand or products and understand customer interest, sentiment, and mood on social media platforms. And then you can publish highly targeted content. All these applications run on the Force.com platform. Salesforce has opened up their platform for companies or developers who would like to extend the functionality of standard applications or even build custom apps. To understand the pricing of their services, you can navigate to products and click on pricing and editions. Here you can find the different editions of all the products and their pricing. If you need more details, you can even download the full edition comparison. Let me talk about the applications that can be built on this platform. Salesforce is suitable for applications that deal with structured data, human oriented in size, and can be accessed from the internet or portal type of applications. There are few companies like Avon Cosmetics and Japan Post who have built their complete ERP on Salesforce. And Salesforce is really good for long tail applications. This chart can help you understand what kind of applications are suitable for the Force.com platform. On the x-axis, you have content, data, process, and transaction. And when I say content, I mean documents, images, audio, video, or any computer-generated content. Data meaning organized set of records. Process, I mean, you can think of events similar to workflow. When something happens, send out an email, or send an approval request, or even assign a task to someone. Transaction. You can think of them like making payments online. On the y-axis, you have the size of audience, a small group of users, the entire department in the company, the whole company itself, or anyone on the web. You see this dark blue area? This area shows the applications that are process-centric and deal with organized data and have significant number of users. This is a ripe area for Salesforce implementation. Applications like HR, CRM, paid time off, benefits enrollment, expense management, help desk procurement, project management, or even recruiting are well suited for this platform. Let me walk you through the application building blocks. There are three application building blocks, your data model, business logic, and user interface. Data model is made up of objects, fields, and relationships. Business logic consists of workflows, validation rules, approval processes, and assignment rules. The UI is made of applications, tabs, page layouts, and record types. You can build your data model, business logic, and the UI declaratively, meaning without having to write a single line of code using the point and click wizards. You can build really fast, but sometimes the business might have complex processes which cannot be built using the declarative syntax. That is when you write a piece of code. You can build any kind of custom UI using Visual Force, a tag-based language very similar to HTML. And you can build any kind of complex business logic using Apex. Apex is a proprietary programming language used to build business logic on this platform. Using Apex and Visual Force, you get more control and flexibility to build any kind of complex applications on this platform. You would want to use the declarative syntax to build your application, and only when you cannot build some functionality using the point and click interface, you would want to write code. During this course, I take this approach of building a custom application from scratch. This way, you'll be well versed with different facets of application building and the capabilities of this platform. We shall be building a custom app for a fictitious company called Universal Containers. 
Universal Containers is a fast-growing startup which needs an application to manage the entire hiring process in the company. There are a couple of high-level requirements they have. They would like to keep track of all the open positions they have in the company, if the positions are open, filled, or cancelled. They would also like to enforce company-wide procedures on how positions are created, submitted, and approved. They would also like to have the recruiting application data in sync with their career portal. They would like to keep track of all the candidates that apply for different positions and track their job application, whether it is phone screening or scheduled for an interview, hired, rejected, or even have passed an offer. They would also want to make sure that the application has approval before it becomes active. They would like to allow employees to post reviews for candidates whom they have interviewed. And they would also like to provide security for the recruiting data so that it is not mistakenly viewed, edited, or deleted by employees who shouldn't have access. They need some automation to inform the recruiter about the next steps that should be taken when a decision has been made about the applicant. And also, the company would like to monitor all the activities in real time through reports and dashboards. From a UI perspective, make it easy for all the recruiters to perform several similar tasks at once, like rejecting multiple job applications. The company wants to automatically inform all the employees of new positions that have been posted. We shall receive more and more requirements about the application as we go further. Based on this set of high-level requirements we have, I would like to model the application like this. I would like to create an object to store all the positions in the company and another object to store all the candidates that apply for different positions. Now, one candidate can apply for multiple positions and also multiple candidates can apply for the same position. So, there is a many-to-many -many relationship between these two objects. To model a many-to-many -many relationship, we need a junction object to keep track of which candidate has applied for which position. And let us call this object with an appropriate name, job application. If you can recollect, the company wanted to keep track of the interview process as well. Therefore, I would like to create an object to keep track of the reviews and ratings posted by the interviewers. Now, to which of this object would you relate reviews? You would probably guess candidates. But if you carefully think, a candidate can apply for more than one position. So, I would relate the reviews object to the job applications. Also, the company would like to advertise their positions on career portals like Monster, Career Builder, and so on. So, I shall use another object called Job Posting to keep track of what position has been advertised on what job portal. It is important to build the ability to restrict access to data that particular users shouldn't see. We are going to implement this with a different set of tools grouped under security and sharing rules. Using these tools, we can set up object level security and record level security. Workflow rules can assign tasks to users to update fields or even send email alerts. Approval processes allow users to submit records like new positions for approval. We can also build custom reports and dashboards that are required for different users across the company. I would like to talk about some very fundamental database concepts. A database is a collection of objects. An object is nothing but a table with rows and columns. Every row is a record and every column is a field. Salesforce uses relational database like other modern day web applications. I'll try to give you an example. There are a couple of records in the position object like senior developer, marketing intern, and so on. Every position has a hiring manager. Sam Jones is the hiring manager for the marketing intern position as well as the recruiter position. I just have a couple of records in this object, but as the number of positions increase, the same person would be the hiring manager for a lot more positions. And the record, Sam Jones would be repeated so many times, which is kind of redundant. To avoid this, we can create another object that contains all the hiring managers and create a relationship between position and user objects. This way, the hiring manager is not repeated in the database. You can see how these two objects, position and user, 
are related to each other using common field user ID. This field is also called a foreign key. In this relationship, the user Sam is considered a parent record and two position records as children. When we talk about relationships, we tend to use this terminology parent and child records. The relationship starts from the child and looks up to the parent. In the next lecture, we shall get started on creating custom objects and fields. I would like to create a position object. To create a new custom object, you can go to Setup, Create, Objects, New Custom Object. I would want to call this Position and plural label as Positions. This object keeps track of all the positions in the org. I would like to call each of these records with a name, Position Title. In the future, I should be able to build reports on this object as well. And I would also like to enable field history tracking. I'll talk about field history tracking later. I'll leave the deployment status to deploy. This will let me use the object. I can also choose to create a tab. I'll skip this option for now and save it. Now the object is created along with the object there are a couple of standard fields that also get created like the ID, created by, last modified by, owner and name. If you noticed, the API name of the object is position double underscore C. So anytime you create a custom object or custom fields, the name would always be appended by double underscore C. Let me go ahead and create a new custom field called job responsibilities. There are a whole bunch of data types that you can choose for your field. I would like to choose text area long and give this field a name. And you can also provide help text for this field. This is too simple and self-explanatory. I'll skip this. And go to my next step. And now the system is prompting me to select for which of these profiles should this field be visible. I'll talk about profiles in detail in a later session but at a high level profile is a set of permissions that define what a user can do within an application. And there are a whole bunch of standard profiles that are available out of the box. This field that I'm creating right now is visible to most of the profiles. I'll leave this to defaults for now and save it. The system is prompting me whether the field should be present on the page layout. Yes, I would want this field to be present on the layout. I'll go ahead and click on Save and New so that I can create few more fields. I would like to create a functional area field. The functional area can be Sales, Marketing, IT, or Miscellaneous. I'll choose a pick list this time. The values for the pick list are Sales, Marketing, IT, or Miscellaneous. And go to my next step. And now I would like to leave this option to defaults and place it on the page layout. I went ahead and created few more fields like educational requirements, minimum pay, maximum pay, open date, and close date. Since I have an object and couple of fields, I would like to create few position records and save them. For that to be possible, I need some UI to access the position object, like one of these standard objects where I can click on the tab and create a new record. Let me go ahead and create a new tab for the position object. I can go to Setup, Create, Tabs, New Custom Object tab. I would like to create a tab for the position object. Choose a tab style and the system is prompting for which of these profiles should this tab be visible. I would like to leave this to defaults for now and go to the next step. 
Now, there are a couple of standard applications that are available. Do you want to append the tab to any of these applications? It doesn't really make sense to add the positions tab to sales application or any other apps out here. I would like to add this tab to a custom application called recruiting that I'm about to create. An application on Salesforce is just a collection of tabs. To create a custom app, I can go to Create, Apps, New Custom App. I would like to call it Recruiting and this application will help manage the recruiting process in the company. I can choose to upload an image for this recruiting application. I'll skip this step for now. I can add the tabs that should be present in my recruiting application. I'll select the Positions tab. And again, to which of these profiles is this application visible? I would like to make this application visible to all the profiles and save it. Now we have a recruiting application and I can create a new position record by clicking on the Positions tab. Let me create one called Marketing Intern. Function area is Marketing. Minimum pay 35,000. Maximum pay of 40. And the job responsibilities are work with designers, create content, manage social media marketing strategy within the company, and educational qualifications, MBA marketing, And I would like to save the record. If you noticed, the page layout is not so great. I can rearrange the fields on the page layout to make it look better. To edit the layout, I can click on the Edit Page Layout link. Here on the Page Layout Editor, I have some tools to organize the page layout. I'll create a section and call it Compensation. and drag both the minimum pay and maximum pay fields into this section. Let me rearrange few more fields. and then save the page layout. This looks much better. You can come back and change this anytime. While creating a record, when I choose the function area as marketing, wouldn't it be nice to show only the marketing related job levels in this pick list instead of showing all the options? We can customize that using field dependencies. Navigate to your object Click on field dependencies and create a new dependency and I would like the controlling field to be the function area and the dependent field to be job level For function area sales I would like to select the following job levels. I can hold the control key on my keyboard and select multiple values at once and click on include. I'll repeat the process for other function areas as well. And save this. Now I should have the field dependency working. Let's go check. When I select the function area as marketing, I see only the marketing job levels. Yeah, it seems to be working. You now have an overview of how to create objects, fields, applications, tabs, and page layouts.
you can go ahead and work on the first assignment. Maintaining good data is essential in any business process. You can use data validations on pretty much every field to control the data quality. To build a validation rule, you need an error condition formula and an error message. Let me give you an example. In the position object, I would like to prevent the user from saving a record if the minimum pay is less than $20,000. To create a validation rule, you would want to open the object. Navigate to Validation Rules, create a new validation rule, and I would want to call this Minimum Pay Rule. Now, I need an error condition formula which will prevent the user from saving a record if minimum pay is less than 20,000. You have to write an error condition formula in such a way that whenever this formula evaluates to true, then the system will prevent the user from saving the record. You have drop downs to make your selection easier. So my formula would be minimum pay less than 20,000. If this condition is true, then prevent the user from saving the record and show the following error message. My error message would be please enter a value greater than or equal to 20,000 and I would like to display this error message next to the minimum pay field. I'll go ahead and save this validation rule and make sure it is active. Let me see if the validation rule works. I'll try saving this position with a minimum salary of 5,000. Yes, I have an error message asking me to enter a value greater than 20,000. I'll make it 30 grand and I should be able to save the record now. Let me show you another example. Since there are two fields on the position object, minimum pay and maximum pay, I would want to make sure that the maximum pay field is always greater than or equal to minimum pay. And to achieve this, I need a validation rule. Let's go create one. I would like to call this maximum pay rule and the error condition formula would be can you guess minimum pay greater than maximum pay so whenever this formula evaluates to true display the following error message the maximum pay cannot be less than minimum pay and I would like to display this error message next to the maximum pay field. And let's save it. I'll try saving this position with the minimum pay greater than maximum pay. And I have an error message asking me, and I have an error message telling me that the maximum pay cannot be less than minimum pay. I'll make the needed changes and I should be able to save the record. Let's talk about another scenario. I have a business requirement. Whenever a position record is being created, the open date should be the current date or any date in the future. It cannot be a date in the past, basically. To achieve this, we can create a validation rule. I'll call this open date rule. Now, I need an error condition formula to handle scenarios like these, there are a whole bunch of functions available like date and time, math, logical and text. I need something to help me with current date. In the list of date and time functions, there is a function called today. I can use this. Select the function and click on insert. You can see the syntax and explanation of what this function does. Today returns the current date. So my error condition formula would be open date less than today. 
and the error message would read, please enter today's date or any date in the future. I would like to save this rule. Let's go try it out. I'm creating a position record. I'll put in the open date as some date in the past and save it. I see an error message. However, if I put in some date in the future, the system should let me save the record. Let's do one last example on validation rules. We have this scenario when a user tries to update the status of the position to closed filled or closed cancelled or closed not approved and if the closed date is not filled then the system should prevent the user from saving the record. That means if the position status is updated to closed then the user should fill in the closed date before saving the record. To tackle this, we need a validation rule. I'll call this closed date rule. We need an error condition formula to check if the status is closed filled or closed cancelled or closed not approved and the closed date is blank. So my error condition formula would be status equals closed filled or status equals closed cancelled or status equals close not approved and close date is blank. I need a way to check if the close date is blank. There is a function called is blank. This formula evaluates to true if the field is blank. So my formula would be is blank close date. Since the status is a pick list, I cannot use this formula like I have done here. There is a function called isPickVal. The function lets me check the value of a picklist. So let me rewrite my formula. And now it would be isPickVal status closed filled or isPickVal status closed cancelled or isPickVal status closed not approved. And is blank close date. To make it easy to read, I can rewrite this formula like this. Take a moment to understand this. The error message would be please fill in the close date, and I would like to display this error message next to the close date field. Now let's go try it out. I'll try to edit the existing position record and update the status to closed cancelled and leave the close date blank and try saving the record. You see the error message? Let me fill in the close date and now the system should let me save the record. I would like to share with you a cheat sheet that contains several examples of validation rules. You can use this as a reference whenever you need to create any. Please do skim through the document to get an idea about different scenarios where you could use validation rules. Let me also show you how to use formula fields. For example, I would like to know the number of days the position was open. To find that out, we need to create a formula field I'll go ahead and create a new field and choose the data type as formula. And the formula would return a number since I'm trying to calculate the number of days the position was open. My formula would be close date minus the open date. This formula might work fine if the status of the position is closed and you have the closed date available. But what if the position was not closed yet? You would want to probably know since how many days is the position open. In that case, the formula would be today minus the open date. 
the formula needs to tackle both the scenarios when the close date is present and the close date is not present. So we can use an if statement here. If the condition is true, return this value. If it is false, then return this value. So if the close date is blank, then the formula would return today minus the open date. And if the close date is present, then it would return close date minus the open date. This formula tackles both the scenarios if the close date is present and if the close date is blank. I'll go ahead and save this field and make it visible to all the profiles and place it on the page layout. Let's go and check how this works. I'll try to open this position record. The status of the position is open and approved. The number of days the position is open is calculated by subtracting the current date minus the open date. If you open the same record tomorrow, you'll see that number increment by one. The formula is clever enough to handle a scenario when the close date is filled. I would like to share with you a cheat sheet that contains several examples of formula fields. Skim through the document to get an idea about different scenarios where you could use formula fields. Now you can go ahead and work on assignment number two. Record types help you build multiple processes that control pick list values and page layouts for different users. Let me give you an example of how we can use record types. When you're creating a record in the position object, you're routed to a page layout where you can see all the fields, including the programming language. You really don't need to see all the programming languages if you are creating a sales or a marketing position, correct? So what you can do is create another page layout, call it non-IT position with all the fields except the programming languages. And then you can create two record types, one IT position and another one non-IT position and link them to the appropriate page layouts. Let's go ahead and build it. First, let me go to the position object and create another page layout. To create a page layout, you would have to clone the existing one. Let me call this non-IT position layout. And since it is non-IT, let me take off the programming language fields and save it. I'll rename the position layout to IT position layout. Now I'll go ahead and create an IT position record type. and link it to the IT position page layout. And this applies for all the profiles as well. I shall talk about profiles in a later session. I can even customize the picklist values for this record type. Since it is IT, I can take off all the functional areas other than IT. Also, create another record type, call it non-IT position. And link it to the non-IT position page layout. And this applies 
to all the profiles as well. I can even control the picklist values based on the record type. I don't have to see IT in the function area picklist. I can take that off and save this. Now, if I try to create a new position record, I can select the record type and I'm routed to the appropriate page layout. If I select IT, I'm routed to the IT position page layout. And if I select non IT, I'm routed to the non IT position page layout. You can see that there are no programming languages here. And you also don't see the IT function area in the picklist. Record types help you build multiple processes, control picklist values, and page layouts for different users. There is a faster way to build your data model using a tool called the schema builder. You can find the schema builder in the build section in the setup menu. You can pan and zoom the canvas. You can see all the standard objects like leads, accounts, contacts, and opportunities that are related to the sales and service cloud applications. You can also create custom objects, fields, and relationships using this tool. In our recruiting application, we need an object to keep track of all the candidates that apply for different positions. Let's go ahead and create the candidate object. I can click on the object and drag it onto the canvas. Give the object a label and plural label as well. Each record would be identified by a number. I would call it candidate number and I would like this number to be auto-generated. The format would be C hyphen 0000 and every time the candidate record is created an auto number would be generated and the count is incremented by one and I would also like to build reports in the future and let's save this object and now we can also create fields by dragging and dropping them onto the object I would like to create a field called the first name I can drag the field of data type text onto the object and give it a label, length of 20 characters, and save it. I went ahead and created all the other fields that are required for the candidate object, like the last name, phone number, address, and the social security number. I would like to make a small note here. Since we have used the schema builder to create the fields, don't be surprised if you cannot see the fields on the page layout. Actually, none of these fields are placed on the page layout. One has to go to the page layout editor and drag all these fields onto the layout. So do remember that if you happen to use the schema builder, you would have to manually place all the fields on the layout. I also need to create a custom tab and add it to the recruiting application. Now we have a UI to create and edit records in the candidate object. You can go ahead and work on assignment number three. Try using the schema builder to create your candidate object. The data model is made of objects, fields, and relationships. So far, we have created a couple of objects and fields. Let's talk about relationship between objects. Objects are related to each other using common fields. There are two main types of relationships. Lookup and master detail. A lookup relationship is a relationship where two objects are loosely coupled. That means the child record is optional and when you delete the parent record, the child record is not deleted. Also, the ownership of the parent record is independent of the child record. And you can create a maximum of 25 lookup relationships per object. I'll talk about a scenario where you can use a lookup relationship. For every position record in the position object, there needs to be an associated hiring manager. And hiring managers are users present in the user object. So I can create a lookup relationship between position and user object. Let's go create one. To create a relationship, I can navigate to my object. In this case, 
I would navigate to the position object, try to create a new custom field, I'll pick lookup relationship, and I would look up to the user object. For every position record in the position object, there needs to be an associated hiring manager. Make this field visible for all the profiles and place it on the page layout. Let's go to the Positions tab and see what the lookup looks like. I can edit some random position record and update the hiring manager for that position. Here, I would like Sam to be the hiring manager for this record. We now have a lookup relationship between position and the user object, which are loosely coupled. The owner of the position record is independent of the user record. And if you happen to delete the user record, the position record is not deleted. A master detail relationship is a relationship where two objects are tightly coupled. You have a cascade delete effect. That means when you delete a parent record, the child record is deleted. Also, the child record inherits ownership from the parent. And you can create a maximum of two master detail relationships per object. We have this requirement where every candidate needs to go through the interview process. And after the interview, all the interviewers can submit their reviews. So to model this, we need a review object to keep track of the reviews. Also, if a job application is deleted, then all the reviews related to that application also need to be deleted. To achieve this cascade delete effect, we can create a master detail relationship between reviews and job application. This table summarizes the differences between lookup and master detail relationship. A lookup relationship is loosely coupled with no cascade delete effect and independent ownership. A master detail relationship, however, is tightly coupled with cascade delete effect and the owner of the parent record inherits the ownership of the related child records. And you can create maximum of 25 lookup relationships and only two master detail relationships per object. Apart from lookup and master detail relationships, there are two special types of relationships, self and many to many. Self relationship is a relationship where an object is related to itself. I would give this example. Within a company, all the user information is stored in the user object and every user in the company would have a reporting manager. And the reporting manager is also one of the users in the company. So, to look up to the reporting manager, you can create a lookup relationship on the user object looking up to itself. To explain what a many to many relationship is, I would give this example. We have all the position records in the position object, all the candidate records in the candidate object. There could be many instances where one candidate can apply to multiple positions or Multiple candidates can apply for the same position. To model this many-to-many -many relationship between these two objects, we need a junction object. This object would keep track of which candidate is applying for which position. Let's call this job application. Let's go ahead and create one. First, let me start by creating a new object. I'll call this job application. I would like to identify every application with an auto number instead of name. JA-0000 starting with number 1. I would like to build reports on this object down the lane and save it. Would like to make a small note here. Whenever you create a junction object to model a many-to-many -many relationship, you need to use the auto number data type. Let me create a lookup to the position object. I can drag and drop a lookup relationship, give it a label, 
I would relate this to positions and save. Let me also create another lookup to the candidate object. I can drag and drop a lookup relationship and give it a label. I would relate this to candidates and save. Let me quickly place these fields on the page layout. and save them. To access this object, I will also create a custom tab make it visible for all profiles and add it to the recruiting application. In the background, I have created couple of records in the position and candidate objects. If I now try to create a job application record, you can see that I can look up to the position object and also to the candidate object, documenting which candidate is applying for which position. Would like to make a small note here. Always use an auto number data type for a junction object and try to name the object appropriately indicating its purpose. In this case, we called it job application. Going back to the master detail relationship that we discussed in the last lecture, we have a scenario where every candidate needs to go through the interview process and later the interviewers need to submit their reviews. So we need a review object to keep track of them. Also, if the job application is deleted, all reviews associated with it also need to be deleted. We can model this using a master detail relationship. Let's first create the review object. This will keep track of all the reviews given by interviewers. I would identify the review record by a number using the auto number data type. And let's create a master detail relationship with the job application object. I would also like to create a couple of fields like technical score. and feedback. Since I'm using the schema builder, I would have to place all these fields on the page layout. And save it. I'm not creating a tab for the review object. You can create one, but I prefer not to. Let's go and see how this works. In the job application object, there is one application. The interviewer can open the record and create a new review by clicking this button. They can fill in the details like the technical score and the feedback and submit the review. A candidate could be interviewed by multiple interviewers. Every interviewer can log in and submit their review. I went ahead and created a couple of reviews in the background for this particular application. Since we have a relationship between job application and reviews, when you open a job application record, you can see all the reviews associated to it in a related list. In the next lecture, I'll talk about roll-up summary fields. If you have a requirement where you are asked to calculate the average technical score for each of these applications, 
and display it on the job application record, then we can leverage rollup summary fields. Rollup summary fields are used to summarize detail records in a master detail relationship. They can do the following operations like count, sum, min, and max. And rollup summary fields can be created only on the parent record in a master detail relationship. To calculate the average technical score, we can divide the total technical score by the number of reviews. To calculate the total technical score on the job application object, we can create a rollup summary field Call it total technical score and I would like to summarize on the review records. I would want to calculate the sum of all technical scores. I'll make this field visible for all the profiles and not place it on the page layout. I would create another rollup summary field, call it number of reviews and I would like to summarize on the review records. I would use count to calculate the number of reviews, make this field visible for all profiles and not place it on the page layout. Then I'll go ahead and create another field, this time a formula field, average technical score. The formula would return a number The formula would be total technical score divided by number of reviews. I would save this field, make it visible for all the profiles and place it on the page layout. Let me go ahead and open a job application record and I can see the average technical score being calculated. Just to quickly summarize, the rollup summary fields can be used only on the parent record in a master detail relationship. You can do count, sum, min and max. All right, now you can go ahead and work on assignment number four. If you open the positions tab, wouldn't it be nice to see few more columns in the position object instead of just the position title? We can add other fields from the search layouts. From create, objects, position object, Scroll down to search layouts and you can edit the positions tab. Select the fields and add them to the layout and save. If you go back, you can see all the fields that I've just added as columns. Looks much better. Also, while creating a job application, you can look up to the positions. But this displays only the position title. Wouldn't it be nice if it could display few more columns like the status and job description? We can add them from the search layouts of the position object. You can edit the lookup dialog layout and select the fields you are interested in and save them. If you now try to create a job application,
you can see more than the position title. Also, while creating a job application, you don't want to create job applications for positions that are already filled or cancelled. You want to create applications for the ones that are open and approved only. Wouldn't it be nice to have a filter to show only positions that are open and approved? You can create a filter on the lookup relationship by navigating to the job application object. Edit the lookup relationship and add a lookup filter to show only positions whose status equals open approved. Let me make this filter optional and save it. Now, when you try to create a new application, you can see only the positions whose status is open approved. Since it is an optional filter, you can also turn it off to see all the position records. Another thing, if you open the Positions tab, you can see that there are a couple of records here. But in real time, the user might be working with few hundreds of records. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to create custom views so that the user can see only the records they are interested in? You can build custom views by clicking this link. Give it a name. For example, you want to see all the positions where travel is required and whose status is closed. And customize your filters. You can specify the filter criteria. Select all positions. Apply filter. Travel required is true. And status equals closed filled or closed cancelled or closed not approved. And let me add couple of these fields to be displayed as columns. And this view is visible to everyone. And save it. The user can quickly click on the view and see only the records they are interested in. You can also create multiple views if you need it to. Search layouts, lookup filters and views let you improve the user experience. What is an external ID? Before I talk about it, let me ask you this question. If you were given a big fat book and asked to find a particular word in that book, what would you do? I guess you would look up the index. Similarly, to be able to quickly query records from an object, you can index any custom field on your object. The custom field should be of data type text, number or email. This index is also called an external ID. Why is it important? It can significantly improve the SOQL query performance and it can also act as a unique identifier for a record and it can be quite helpful during an update or an upsert operation. Upsert is a combination of both insert and update operations. I'll try to expand on this when I talk about importing records. You can create up to three external IDs per object. You would want to create external IDs on unique fields like phone number, email or social security number. Let me make the social security number field on the candidate object as an external ID. From the schema builder, 
I can navigate to the candidate object, edit the social security number field, and set this field as an external ID. Since I'm on the screen, let me also talk about unique fields. You can choose to make a field unique if you need to. You can also choose to enable case sensitivity for uniqueness. Once you have your objects ready, you might want to import data into your objects. There are a couple of things that need to be taken care of. It is very important to have a clean import file. Make sure that the field names used in the import file are same as the ones defined in your object. We can use the import wizard to load data. Using this wizard, you can load up to 50,000 records. If you happen to have more than 50,000, then we can use the data loader tool, which I'll talk about later. You can see how the objects are related to one another in this entity relationship diagram. These relationships determine the order in which data should be loaded. Also notice that every object has a couple of standard fields like created by, last modified by, owner, which are lookup to the user object. Just to avoid clutter, I've shown these fields only on the position object. However, those fields are present in every object and dependencies dictate the order in which data is loaded. Therefore, you want to create records in the user object first, then load records into the position object, then candidates, then Java applications, and finally reviews. We already have a record in the user object, which is mine. Let me show how you can use the import wizard to load data. I have some sample data of positions, candidates, and job applications in a CSV format. Here is a CSV file that contains position records that I would like to import. To import records into the position object, I'll use the data import wizard. This wizard will quickly replace all these four links. I'll launch this wizard, then load records into the position object. I would like to add new records. You might want to choose the other options if you were trying to update records. For these records that are being imported, who's going to be the owner? I can have a column in my import file with the owner names of each record. For now, I'll choose none so that the person who's importing the records would be the owner, which is me right now. And on the position object, we have a hiring manager field which is a lookup to the user object. So the system is prompting if we had a column in the import file determining who the hiring manager is for every record. Right now, I don't have a column with the hiring manager in the import file. I can drag and drop the import file and click next. These are the fields on my object. And these are the field names from the CSV file. The system automatically mapped most of the fields since the names are identical. Looks like there are a couple of fields that are not mapped. I guess this is because I might have named this field different. Educational qualifications. And also another field looks like I called it job responsibilities. And I know that I have not mapped the hiring manager field because I don't have it in the import file. Let's go to the next step. I have a snapshot showing me what I'm trying to do. Let me start the import. I'll be notified by an email once the import is complete. You can see that 12 records are successfully imported.
If you happen to get any errors during the import, you can easily debug them based on the error messages. You can now work on the assignment to import records into your objects. You have the CSV files in the assignments folder. Let me talk about design considerations to accommodate multiple users in our application and control access to records. There are a couple of things that need to be considered when designing an application like who will be using the app, what do these users expect to see and do, what data is most important, what should these users be able to see, and are there any restrictions for these users? How can the user experience be streamlined and efficient? And also, which users should be able to customize the app? I'll talk about a couple of requirements and show you tools available on this platform to tackle them. At this company, Universal Containers, recruiters need to create, view, and modify records in the positions, candidates, job applications, and reviews objects. Recruiters, hiring managers, and interviewers should not have the ability to delete any records in the recruiting app. Hiring managers should be able to create new positions and view and update all the fields for positions where they are the hiring manager. Interviewers should be able to view all positions. Interviewers should only be able to view candidates and job applications to which they have been assigned. Interviewers should not be able to see sensitive candidate information like social security numbers. Interviewers should be able to create and edit their own reviews. Based on the following needs, we can quickly create a matrix documenting the objects on x-axis and different kinds of actors like recruiter, hiring manager and interviewer on the y-axis. I have a legend here. C for create, R for read, E for edit, and D for delete. R star, read where assigned, E star, edit where assigned, and delete where assigned. R double star, read their own records, edit their own records, and delete their own records. Based on the requirements, I can fill in this matrix. Recruiters need to create, view, and modify records in the positions, candidates, job applications, and reviews objects. Recruiters, hiring managers, and interviewers should not have the ability to delete any records in the recruiting app, so none of them get delete access. Hiring managers should be able to create new positions and view and update all fields for positions where they are the hiring manager. So they get create, read where assigned, and edit where assigned. Interviewers should be able to view all positions. Interviewers should only be able to view candidates and job applications to which they have been assigned. Interviewers should not be allowed to see sensitive candidate information like social security numbers. We cannot really document this requirement in this matrix but we can tackle this requirement using field-level security, which I'll discuss later. Interviewers should be able to create and edit their own reviews. Let's see how to use profiles to establish these permissions. A profile is a set of permissions that control what a user can do within their organization. Every user is assigned to a profile, Let's look at profiles that are available from Setup, Manage Users, Profiles. There are a whole bunch of profiles that are available out of the box. This is quite confusing for the first time users, but they do come in handy while customizing the app. I also want you to notice that every profile is associated with a license type. To keep it simple, just pay attention to only the profiles that belong to the Salesforce and platform licenses. Let me open some random profile, maybe the standard user profile. Here, you can customize what page layouts are assigned for each of the object. 
what fields should be visible or hidden for this profile? What applications should be visible? Also, if a user can access the application using a mobile app, what tab should be visible? And what record type should be available for this profile? You also have a whole bunch of administrative permissions. Let me mention a couple of important ones, like if the user could write Apex code, access the application via API, if they can create reports and dashboards, and folders to store them, manage login policies, manage roles, manage sharing, translation, password settings, scheduling reports, transfer of record ownership, ability to view all users and data, ability to see reports and dashboards in public folders, and also the setup configuration. Most of these permissions are self-explanatory. And also, general user permissions related to standard sales and service cloud applications. There are quite a few here as well. Let me highlight a couple of important ones. Activating and approving contracts. Ability to convert leads into accounts. Ability to download applications from App Exchange. Use the Dashboard Builder. Export reports. Import leads. Import solutions. Manage cases. Access to the Report Builder. Run reports. Ability to transfer leads or cases. Most of the permissions in this section are related to the standard objects available out of the box. Here in this section, you can customize the object level access, whether a user can read, create, edit, or delete records in any of the standard objects or custom objects, some password policies, and also you can customize the login hours and the IP ranges. For security purpose, you can let a user log in only if they are in a particular IP range. I want you to notice this. This profile is associated with a Salesforce license. And that's the reason you see permissions related to all standard objects like accounts, cases, contracts, leads, opportunities, products, price books, and solutions. Even in the field level security section, you see all the standard objects. You can see all the standard and custom apps. Let me quickly open another profile which belongs to the platform license. This one looks like the previous profile, but it does not have permissions related to all standard objects like the one before. For example, in the page layout section, I don't see leads, opportunities, cases, or solutions. Same in the field level security. And in the app section, I don't see the standard apps like sales, call center, or marketing. So the point is, a profile that belongs to a platform license lets you customize permissions related to all custom objects and custom apps, but limited permissions related to the standard objects. To quickly summarize, profiles control what standard and custom apps users can view, what tabs users can see, which record types are available to users, what page layouts can users see, object permissions that allow users to create, read, edit, and delete records, which fields within objects users can view and edit, permissions that allow users to manage system and apps within it, what Apex classes and Visual Force pages users can access. You can also control the login hours and IP ranges from which users can log in. Going back to the requirement matrix, since we have a couple of actors here, we can create a profile for recruiter, another one for hiring manager, and interviewer, and then assign users to appropriate profiles. Let's create a recruiter profile. To create a profile, you can go to Setup, Manage Users, Profiles. You can create a new profile only by cloning an existing one. 
it would make sense for me to clone a profile that belongs to the platform license because the recruiter needs to access only the recruiting app and doesn't need access to the standard sales or service cloud applications. Let me clone the standard platform user which belongs to the platform license. Give this profile a name and save it. Notice that the clone profile belongs to the same license type as its parent. I can now customize the recruiter profile. The recruiter needs to see the recruiting app, all the tabs for positions, candidates, job applications, and also the recruiters need to create, view, and modify records in positions, candidates, job applications, and reviews. Recruiters should not have the ability to delete any records in the recruiting app. And save this. In the next lecture, let's talk about creating users and assigning them to a profile. Every user needs a license. A Salesforce license gives access to standard applications and the platform. A Salesforce platform license gives access only to the platform and any custom functionality that is built on the platform. Feature licenses determine whether users have access to additional features like mobile or content. You can purchase as many licenses as required by your org. If you expand company profile and take a look at company information, you'll be able to see the different types of licenses. How many have been purchased by your org? How many of those licenses are used? And how many are remaining? Since this is a developer instance, you can use it to build, test, and play with your app. There are quite a few limitations. You cannot use this as a production instance. You would have to purchase licenses from Salesforce for real-time use. In this developer instance, I have three platform licenses and two Salesforce licenses. There is one license that is being used, which is mine. I just want you to ignore the other types of licenses for now. To create users, you can go to Manage Users, New User, pass in the details like name, email, and username. I need to select the license type and also assign the user to a profile. If you can recollect, Every profile is associated with a license type. This guy is a recruiter, so I would like to assign him to the recruiter profile. The recruiter profile is associated with the Salesforce platform license type. I can see all the profiles that are associated with it. Let me select the recruiter profile and save it. Now this user gets access to all the permissions that are defined in the recruiter profile. And by the way, I have just used up one platform license right now. If I quickly switch to the org details, you can see that I've used one platform license. I would like to make a small note here. You cannot delete user records. You can only deactivate them. So that you can use this license for someone else. In case if you need it to. You can go ahead and work on the assignment. We can create a recruiter profile, customize it, and assign it to all users who are recruiters. Imagine there are four recruiters and you have assigned them to the recruiter profile. And now you have a requirement where one of these recruiters needs access to the report builder and other recruiters should not be given access to it. How do we tackle this? If we modify the recruiter profile and add the report builder access, then it would apply to all the recruiters, which does not solve the problem. So your guess might be to create a new profile with all the permissions that a recruiter profile would have, including the report builder access. This will work, but there is an easier way to tackle this using permission sets. A permission set is a collection of settings and permissions 
that give users access to various tools and functions. The permissions are also found in profiles, but permission sets extend users' functional access without changing their profiles. So, for the recruiter who needs access to the report builder, instead of creating a new profile, we can easily create a permission set with the report builder access and assign it to the user. Few things you need to make note of. A permission set is associated with a license type. A permission set can contain multiple permissions. And also, a permission set can be assigned to multiple users. We can assign a permission set to a user provided the user is assigned to a profile of the same license type. To create a permission set, go to Manage Users, Permission Sets. Let's create a permission set with the Report Builder access. New Permission Set, Build Reports, Report Builder access. And notice that I have to select the license type, which would be Salesforce platform, because I wanted to assign this permission set to a user who's assigned to a profile that belongs to a Salesforce platform license type. I can quickly search for the report builder access. I can enable and save it. To assign it to a user, I can go to Manage Users, Users, and select the user you want to assign this permission set. From the Permission Set Assignment Related list, I can click on Edit Assignments and add the permission set and save it. This permission set can be assigned to a user who belongs to a profile that is associated with the Salesforce platform license. Also, if you want to give user a couple of permissions for a limited period of time, permission sets can come in handy. You can quickly add and remove permission sets from the related list on the user record. Using field accessibility, you can control whether a field should be visible, read-only, or hidden for a particular profile. For example, we have a scenario where the recruiters should not be able to see the social security number field on the candidate records. You can tackle this using field accessibility. You can set up field accessibility by going to Security Controls, Field Accessibility, select the object I would like to view by field, select the Social Security Number field. I can see whether the field is hidden or editable for all these profiles. Let me make the field hidden for all the recruiters. I can edit the recruiter profile and make the social security number field hidden. Now, when a user with a recruiter profile logs in, they will not be able to see the field on the candidate record. Field level security is a nice way to secure data in the sharing model. Queue is a virtual location where records can be stored until they are processed by a queue member. It helps in sharing the workload. Records remain in the queue until they are accepted by the queue member or transferred to someone else. Every member of the queue would have ownership level of access to records in the queue. I'll try to explain the use of a queue by giving you this example. Imagine a company is selling automobile insurance. Customers can go online and request a quote. The company also has a dedicated sales team to handle such requests. When a customer requests a quote, a lead is created in the leads object and someone from the sales team needs to take ownership of the lead. So, to make this process simple, we can create a queue which will take ownership of all the leads that get created. The sales team should be able to access the queue. We can achieve that by making them member of the queue and any member can pick up a lead from the queue and assign it to themselves and work on it. 
This way, it becomes very easy to share the workload among the sales team. Let me show you this. When a new lead record is created, the ownership needs to change to the leads queue. Let's create a queue on the leads object. I can go to Setup, Manage Users, Queues. We'll create a new queue, call this Leads Queue. I would like to assign the leads object to the queue. Remember, a queue can support multiple objects. And I can add members to the queue. Only these members will be able to access the records from the queue. And our queue is ready. If I go back to the leads object and try to create a new lead, the creator becomes the owner of the lead. I can go ahead and manually change the ownership to the leads queue. However, I need this to be automated. I can use a workflow to achieve this. Whenever a new lead is created, update the owner to the leads queue. To create a workflow, I can go to my setup, create, workflows and approvals. And I would like to create a new rule on the leads object. I'll call this update lead ownership. When a new lead is created, update the ownership to the leads queue. And the evaluation criteria would be, when a record is created, I need to put in some rule criteria. I don't really have a rule. But since this is required, I came up with this criteria like create a date not equal to Jan 1st, 1940 so that this rule will always fire. I'll go to the next step and configure an immediate workflow action, which would be a field update. I'll call this update owner field. I can select the field that needs to be updated, which is the owner field to a queue. Select the leads queue and save. Whenever a lead is created and created date not equal to Jan 1st, 1940, trigger an immediate action to update the owner to the leads queue. I can click on done and activate it. Let's go try this out by creating a new lead. I can put in the basic required fields and save the record and you can see the ownership automatically updated to the leads queue. To access the leads queue, you can click on the leads tab, click on the views drop down and select the queue. I would like to make a small note here. Only the members of the queue can access the records. They can select the record and accept them. And once it's accepted, the record is no longer in the queue. The ownership is transferred from the queue to the user. This way, queues help in sharing workload among team members. Records remain in the queue until they are accepted by the queue member or transferred to someone else. Every member of the queue would have ownership level of access to records in the queue. Workflows can be used to automate business process. A workflow can trigger an action when a record is created or edited. This action can be immediate or time dependent. Workflows can trigger the following actions like assigning a task to someone, doing a field update, or sending out an email, or even sending an outbound message. 
from Salesforce application, we can send out a SOAP message to a target system. This can be used to keep the target systems in sync with Salesforce. Let's talk about a scenario where a workflow can be used to send out an email. When a position record is created in the org and the status is changed to open and approved, notify all the people in the company about the new position in the org. We can use a workflow rule to automate this. To create a workflow rule, you can go to Setup, Workflows and Approvals, New Workflow Rule. I would like to create a workflow rule on the position object. I'll call this rule New Position Alert. And when the status of the position changes to Open and Approved, notify all the users in the company by an email. There are a couple of choices of evaluation criteria when a record is created, or every time a record is created, or when a record is created or edited to subsequently meet the rule criteria. Here, in our case, the evaluation criteria would be when a record is created or edited to subsequently meet the rule criteria. And the rule criteria would be status equals open approved. This criteria is quite clever because there could be a position that just got created with status as new position and sometime later is updated to open and approved and you still want this workflow to be triggered. Let me go to the next step. The workflow can trigger the following actions. These actions can be immediate or time dependent. I would want to trigger an immediate action to send out an email alert. I'll call this workflow action new position email alert. And I also need an email template for this. Let me do that in a new tab. To create an email template, you can go to communication templates, email templates. I'll go ahead and choose a text template. And the template would read, hello, there is a new position in our company and the job responsibilities are and the salary ranges and referrals can earn an attractive bonus. Thanks, hiring manager. I would want to insert fields from the position object onto this template. I can use the merge field values from the position object. I can select the fields and copy the merge field value and paste it on the template. I can copy paste the job responsibilities, minimum pay, and maximum pay. I'll make this template available for use and save this email template. It is currently saved in the unfiled public email templates folder. I can go back to my earlier screen where I was creating the workflow action and use this template. The template is new position alert email and the recipients would be all the users in the company. If there were more users in the org, then I could add all of them as recipients of this email. We can also add five external email addresses. I can save this workflow action and activate this workflow. To test it out, I'll go ahead and update the status of an existing position to open and approved and save it. I should have received an email alert. Let me go check. Here I have an email which is nicely formatted and you can see how the merge field values are rendered onto the template. So every time a position status changes to open and approved, all the recipients are notified by an email. Let me talk about another scenario. The company is working with a partner 
to help them recruit talent. When a position status is updated to open and approved, send out a message to the partner system after two days. So when a position is created and approved, the partner is notified that they can start looking out for potential candidates. We can achieve this using a workflow. Since we already have an existing workflow with the same criteria, I can add a time trigger and a workflow action to it. To modify an existing workflow, you need to deactivate it first. I can create a time trigger two days after the rule trigger date. I would like to send an outbound message to update the target system. And update the target system with the position information. The endpoint URL is the location to which the message has to be sent. I'll just make up this random URL, but in real time, you can find this out from the system administrator of the target system. And I would like to send the information present in all these fields. And let me save this workflow and activate it. Now, I need to generate a WSDL file for this outbound message and send it to the administrator of the target system. WSDL stands for Web Services Definition Language. To generate one, you can go to the outbound messages present in the workflow section. This was the outbound message which I just created. You can click on this link. This file contains information about the payload it carries. You can see the object information and all the fields it is carrying. and the message destination. You don't have to worry about all these details. I'm trying to give you an overview of the process. You can save the file and probably email this to the administrator of the target system. The administrator can import the WSDL file into the target system. This will help the target system understand and process the incoming messages. So, Whenever a position status changes to open and approved, an immediate action is fired, an email is sent out to all the people in the company, and two days later, an outbound message is sent to the target system. You can also use workflows to assign tasks to someone or update a field on a record. We have tools that can help us build and configure an approval process. An approval process is an automated process your organization can use to approve records in Salesforce. Before building an approval process, one needs to think about the following. What kind of records can be submitted for approval? Who can submit the records? Once the record is submitted for approval, where is it routed to? And what happens if the record is approved? Or what happens if the record is rejected or even recalled? Using the tools on this platform, you can build a single or a multi-step approval process. In a single step approval process, when a user submits the record for approval, the request is sent to the approver. If the record is approved, then approval actions are triggered. And if the record is rejected, then the rejection actions are triggered. In a multi-step approval process, when a user submits the record for approval, the request is sent to the approver. If the record is approved, it is sent to another approver. If the record is approved, approval actions are triggered. And if the record is rejected, then the rejection actions are triggered. You can have up to 30 steps in an approval process. An approval process can also have multiple approvers in a single step. When a user submits a record for approval, the request can be sent to multiple approvers. All the approvers need to approve the record for it to be approved or else the request is rejected. 
This is called unanimous approval. When a user submits a record for approval, it is sent to multiple approvers. The record would be approved or rejected based on the first user to respond to that request. If they approve, the record is approved. If they reject it, the record is rejected. This is called first approval or rejection. An approval process can trigger the following actions like assigning a task to someone, sending out an email or doing a field update or even sending an outbound message. There are wizards that make it easy to customize even a complex approval process. In the next lecture, I'll talk about a scenario where we need an approval process for our recruiting app. For our recruiting app, we need an approval process to submit new positions for approval. We want to make sure that a manager approves any position that his or her employee creates and that any position with a minimum salary of more than 150,000 is approved by the CEO. Let's get started. For this approval process, the only preliminary step we need to define is an email template that can be used to notify the designated approver that he or she has pending approval request. You can build it from Setup, Communication Templates, Email Templates, Give it a name, Subject, New Position Requires Approval. The email would read, A new position record has been submitted for your approval. Please visit the link below and either approve it or reject it. Thanks. Now that we have finished our preparation, we are ready to define the approval process itself. The approval process definition acts as a framework for the approval steps and actions that we define later. Search for the approval process. We need an approval process to submit new positions for approval. There are two different wizards that we can use to create a new approval process. A jumpstart wizard and a standard setup wizard. The jumpstart wizard skips a couple of steps. Let me use the standard setup wizard so that we can take a look at all the options that are available. I'll call this process approve new position. Ensure that the manager approves any position that his or her employee creates and any position with a minimum salary of greater than 150,000 is approved by the CEO. Let's define the criteria so that only new positions can be submitted for approval. And all positions created by a user other than the CEO must be approved by at least a direct manager. In our case, Anthony is the CEO of Universal Containers. Go to the next step. From the next automated approver determined by the drop down list, select Manager. The Manager field is a standard field on the user object that designates the user's manager. Alternatively, you could have defined a new custom hierarchical relationship field on the fly. For this approval process, though, the standard manager field is perfect, so let's move on. Use approver field of position owner. When you select this checkbox, the approval request is routed to the user specified in the manager field on the record owner's user record. If you don't select this checkbox, the approval request is routed to the manager of the user submitting the record. In our case, we want to obtain approval from the position owner's manager. So select this checkbox. Record editability allows you to specify whether a record that's been submitted for approval can be edited by the approver before being approved. Since we don't want managers to change that, we'll only let administrators perform edits while a record is in our approval process. Let's go to the next step. Select the email template that we just created. Here, we need to specify which fields should be displayed on the approver page layout, which the approver sees when he or she approves 
or rejects a record. Let me add a couple of fields. Position title, job description, minimum pay, and maximum pay. And I also want the approval history to be displayed as a related list. This information shows whether this record was submitted for approval in the past, who were the designated approvers, and whether it was approved or rejected. Finally, before leaving this page, we can specify the security settings to determine whether an approver can approve or reject records from a mobile device. Unless it's a mandatory requirement for your approvers, it's better not to choose this option because it prevents a user from manually selecting an appropriate approver for a record. We'll leave the default choice selected for now. The last page of the approval process wizard allows us to choose who should be allowed to submit records for approval. Again, we'll just leave the default record owner selected because there's no reason for another user to have this power. And allow submitters to recall approval requests, just in case, and save. We have finished defining the framework for our approval process but we won't be able to activate it unless we have given it some steps and some actions to fire when records are actually approved or rejected. Let's move on to those now. Let me go back to the process detail page. As we said earlier, every approval process consists of a set of steps that are required to approve the creation of a new record, and each step allows one or more designated approvers to accept or reject the submitted record. For our new position approval process, we need to define two steps. One that requires approval from the record submitters manager for all new position records, and one that requires additional approval from the CEO for position records with minimum salaries in excess of 150,000. Let's define the first step for all new position records now. In this first step, we want the approval request to go to the position owners manager. I'll call it Manager Approval. Every new position record must be approved by the position owner's manager. This is going to be the first step. By assigning this as step 1, it will be the first to execute when the approval process is triggered. This step allows us to define the criteria or create a formula that filters the records that require approval during this step. Because we have already filtered out position records that are owned by the CEO, from the whole approval process, this step does not need any additional filtering. Let's go to the next step. Finally, we have to select the assigned approver for this step and specify whether his or her delegate is allowed to approve the request as well. Because this is a manager approval step, it clearly makes sense to accept the default option of automatically assign using the custom field selected earlier, which is the manager. The approver's delegate may also approve this request and save. We are faced with another choice to create optional approval or rejection actions for this step or return to the approval process detail page. Take me back to the approval process detail page to review what I've just created. From the approval steps related list, let's create a new approval step. This time, CEO's approval. Every new position record with a minimum salary over 150,000 must be approved by the CEO. It's the second step. Here, we only want to send positions with a minimum salary of over 150,000 to the CEO. Enter the step if the following criteria are met. Minimum pay greater than 150,000 and save. The approver for this step is the CEO. From the drop down list, look up to the user who is the CEO in your organization. In this case, I am picking Anthony, who is the CEO of Universal Containers. We are keeping this approval process fairly simple. But if we wanted to, we could send the approval request to multiple approvers in this step and determine whether the user's approval request needed unanimous approval or if the record would be approved or rejected based on the first user to respond to that request. Approve or reject based on first response. 
the approver's delegate may also approve this request. The next section allows us to specify what to do with the record if it's rejected at this step. Because the position record is locked from editing during the approval process, it makes the most sense to perform the final rejection. You can perform all rejection actions for this step and all final rejection actions and save. Once again, we are faced with a choice to define approval or rejection actions for this particular step. I'll do this later. Take me back to the process detail page to review what I've just created. Now that we have finished defining our approval process steps, we are nearly done. All that remains is to specify the approval actions that could occur whenever a record is initially submitted or when it's finally approved or rejected. From the initial submission actions related list, let's add a new action and select field update. Set status to pending approval. While a position is in the approval process, its status should be set to pending approval. The status field should be set to specific value. Pending approval. And save. You can also configure final approval actions and rejection actions. From the final approval actions related list, I can add a new action and select a field update and set status to open approved. After the position is approved, its status should be set to open approved. The status field should be set to specific value. Its status should be set to open approved and save. From the final rejection actions related list, you can also configure rejection actions like updating the status field to closed not approved. We are all done with defining our approval process. But in order to test it, it needs to be activated. Fortunately, the force.com platform has a process visualizer that renders the approval process as a flowchart. The flowchart contains all the critical details for each approval process, including the steps necessary for a record to be approved, the designated approvers for each step, the criteria used to trigger the approval process, and the actions that take place when a record is approved, rejected, or recalled. Now, let's test our approval process. From setup, Manage Users, Users, and edit the user record, and select the Manager field so that the approval chain is properly set up. Let me set Sam as my manager, and save. Now, let me create a new position. Notice that after clicking Save, the detail page displays a Submit for Approval button in the new approval history related list. I can submit the record for approval. Submitting the record for approval causes several things to happen. First, the record is locked from editing as shown by the lock icon at the top of the page. Additionally, two new entries appear in the approval history related list showing who submitted the record and the current approval assignment. Finally, the manager of the position owner is notified by an email that there is a new position to approve. When the manager next logs in and visits the record, he or she can click on the button to see the approval request and approve or reject the record with comments. If the approver accepts the record, it progresses to the next step of the approval process. With just a few minutes of work, we have built an effective business process that will make all of Universal Containers users more effective. Data security plays an important role in any business process. You want to control which users have access to an object, what fields are visible to the user, and what records are accessible to the user. 
you have learned to control the object level access using profiles and permission sets and field level access using field level security. Let's talk about features on this platform that will let us control the record level security. Before we dive in, a user can be given different levels of access to records read only, edit, and full access. Full access gives users privileges like ability to share records transfer ownership, and even delete records. When you have multiple users accessing the application, you want to think about who has access to records in an object, what level of access do they have, and why do they have access. Every user can access their own records, but what about records that one does not own? To control the record level security, we have organization-wide defaults. Organization-wide defaults is the baseline level of security access for records one does not own. It can be set up for every object. If the organization-wide defaults is private, users have access to only their records. If it's public read-only, every user is allowed to read all the records. If the organization-wide defaults is public read-write, every user is allowed to read and edit all the records. And remember, Organization-wide defaults is the only way to secure access to records while building the sharing model. Determining the organization-wide defaults is quite simple. You would want to pick the most restricted user of an object and ask yourself the following questions. At any instance, should this user not be allowed to see any records? If the answer is yes, then the organization-wide defaults are private. If no, then you would want to ask yourself another question. At any instance, should this user not be allowed to edit any records? If yes, then the organization-wide defaults are public read-only. If no, then it's public read-write. To set up organization-wide defaults, you can go to Security Controls, Sharing Settings. Here, you can set up org-wide defaults for both standard and custom objects. Let me change the organization-wide defaults of the position object to private. This will make sure that every user can access only their records in the position object. I would like to make a small note here. For the two standard objects, leads and cases, you have one more organization-wide default setting, which is public read-write transfer. This permission lets users transfer ownership of records from one user to another. And if two objects are related by a lookup relationship, they have independent organization-wide defaults. But when they are related by a master detail relationship, the child object inherits organization-wide defaults from the parent. You can notice the review object inheriting organization-wide defaults from the job application object. Let's see how we can use organization by defaults in a particular scenario. There are four users who have access to records in the position object. User 2 should not be allowed to see any records other than his own. User 3 and 4 should be allowed to see all the records owned by users 1 and 2. Since user 2 is the most restricted user, the org-wide defaults would be private. This gets you into thinking, how can user 3 and 4 access other records? You can make exceptions to organization by defaults. I'll talk about them in the next lecture. You can make exceptions to organization by defaults using public groups, sharing rules, manual sharing, and role hierarchy. A public group can be a collection of users, roles, roles and subordinates, and other public groups. Public group can be used in a sharing rule or it can be used to share a folder. Sharing rules are used to open up access to records and will never be more strict than organization-wide defaults. There are two types of sharing rules that you can build, ownership-based and criteria-based. You can use ownership-based sharing rule in a scenario where records that are owned by a group of users 
have to be shared with another group. You can use criteria-based sharing rule in a scenario where position records whose status is closed filled should be shared with a particular group. Let me go back to the earlier scenario where user 3 and 4 should be allowed to see all the records owned by users 1 and 2. We can go ahead and create two groups, group A with user 1 and 2 and group B with users 3 and 4. And then create a sharing rule saying that all the records owned by group A should be visible for group B. Let's create a group first. From Setup, Manage Users, Groups, I'll go ahead and create a new group, call it Group A, and I'll add User 1 and User 2 to that group. Let's create the second group, call it Group B, and I'll add Users 3 and 4 to that group. To create a sharing rule, from the administration setup, security controls, sharing settings, just below the organization by defaults, you can create sharing rules on standard and custom objects. Let me create a new sharing rule on the position object. Call it sharing rule 1. Records owned by members of group A should be shared with group B. This sharing rule is based on ownership. Now, I would like to create a sharing rule to share all the records owned by members of group A with group B. And they get read level access. You can also do a sharing rule based on criteria. Like, records that meet a particular criteria have to be shared with certain group of users. I would like to make a small note here. Sharing rules can be created by administrators only. Now, let's talk about manual sharing. Manual sharing allows users to grant one-off access to their individual records for users, roles, and public groups. For example, I can quickly share any record that I own by clicking the sharing button. I can share the record with a user, group, roles, or roles and subordinates. And specify the access level, whether it's read-only or read-write, and save. Users who can manually share records are record owners, administrators, or any user above the role of the record owner's role. I'll help you understand this better when I talk about roles and hierarchy. Let's talk about a scenario. Within an organization, you have a couple of sales reps who report to the sales manager, and you have service reps who report to the services manager, and both these managers report to the VP, and the VP in turn reports to the CEO. In the scenario, all records that are accessible by the sales reps need to be visible to the manager, and the VP and the CEO. Similarly, all the records that are accessible by the manager need to be accessible for the VP and the CEO. To make all the sharing possible, you would have to probably create so many sharing rules, making it complex and hard to maintain. Or you can define roles and hierarchy. Once you define roles and hierarchy within Salesforce, all the records that are accessible by the sales reps can also be accessed by the sales manager, VP, and the CEO. If the sales rep has ownership level of access to record, then the manager, VP, and the CEO also inherit ownership level of access to that record. Role and subordinates of the manager services implies it would be the manager services and all the users below in the hierarchy. Role and subordinates of the VP implies it would be the VP and all users below in the hierarchy. Let's create roles and define hierarchy. To set up roles, search for roles, 
there's a predefined role hierarchy just as an example you can delete all these and create new roles to suit your business process you can quickly assign a user to a role let me assign the user anthony to the ceo role based on your requirement you can assign users to different roles and define hierarchy so roles let you control the visibility of records within the org a user can be associated with only one role you can create a maximum of 500 roles in an org roles and hierarchy doesn't have to be your company's organizational chart the objective to using roles and hierarchy is to make sharing records easier users usually inherit the privileges of data owned by users below them in the hierarchy however if you would like to turn it off you can by going to your sharing settings and turning off grant using hierarchies it can only be done for custom objects to summarize you can control what objects can a user see using profiles and permission sets what fields can a user see using field level security what records should be hidden by default using organization wide defaults and if there are any exceptions that need to be made we can use sharing rules manual sharing and role hierarchy you have tools on this platform to debug if something is not working the way it is supposed to you can use the debug logs a debug log can record database operations system processes and errors that occur when executing a transaction or running unit tests you have to specify the user whose actions have to be monitored right now let me set myself up to be monitored the log can pretty much record every event that occurs when executing a transaction and can get very exhaustive you can set up filters to determine what information you need to capture and the level of detail you can capture information about database events workflows and approvals validation rules apex and visual force and system issues these categories are helpful when you write apex code or visual force pages you can even set the level of detail you're interested in i just want to show you how the log looks like for example if i need to debug my validation rules i can set up the log to capture the events related to validation rules and save it i just want to remind you that i have couple of validation rules that are active To keep it simple I have deactivated all validation rules except maximum pay rule This rule prevents the record from being saved if the minimum pay is greater than the maximum pay I'll try to create a new position record community manager I put in a minimum pay of 80000 and maximum pay of 60000 and try to save it the validation rule seems to be working and i see the error message as well but just in case if it was not working the way it is supposed to then you can look up the log let me open the log file you can actually see the execution line by line validation rule is triggered when a new record is created there is a time stamp for every event it is checking to see if the minimum pay is greater than maximum pay since minimum pay is greater than maximum pay the validation failed and we have the error message this log really comes in handy helping you understand the order of execution and where exactly is the validation failing this makes debugging easy so to set up the debug log you need to select the user who needs to be monitored and select the events you are interested in 
and the level of detail you're interested in. Then you execute the transaction and come back to see the log, which will have the record of database operations, system processes, and errors that occur when executing a transaction. Debug logs are really useful for advanced developers who write code in Apex and Visual Force. In the next lecture, I'll talk about auditing tools that are available on this platform. There are a couple of tools on this platform to help you with auditing, like Setup Audit Trail and Field History Tracking. The Setup Audit Trail keeps track of all the changes that are made to the application from the beginning of time. You can view the audit trail from Security Controls, View Setup Audit Trail. This trail has information about every change that is made to the application, like creating objects, fields, validation rules, workflows, approvals, and any customization that is made. It is currently showing the last 20 changes, but you can download the entire trail for the last six months as a CSV file. Please do make a note that this trail does not keep track of records. Field History Tracking This tool lets you keep track of changes made to a record. For example, if someone updated the status of the position to closed field and you want to know who did it and when, to keep track of that, you can enable field history tracking on that field. From Setup, Object, Set History Tracking. Let me enable history tracking for the status field on the position object. You can enable history tracking for a maximum of 20 fields per object. Let me save this and go back to the position record and edit the page layout to add the position history related list. Drag and drop it onto the page layout and save. You can now keep track of all the changes made to the status field in the related list. Let me also talk about Login History. You can open it from Setup, Manage Users, Login History. This keeps track of who logged into the application and when, the IP address, what browser, and what operating system. You can see the last 20,000 logins if you need more information, you can download the last six months login trail as a CSV file. Tools like the Setup Audit Trail, Field History Tracking, and Login History bring in transparency and accountability for all users of the application. Reporting Framework is tightly integrated into the Salesforce platform. To add Reports tab to the application, I can go to Create Applications and add Reports and Dashboards to the Recruiting app. One needs to have access to the Report Builder on their profile to be able to build reports. Salesforce provides a couple of standard reports out of the box related to sales and call center applications. As you can see, there are a whole bunch of standard reports that are available out of the box related to leads, accounts, contacts, opportunities, cases, etc. You can choose to use them or build something from ground up. There are four different kinds of reports you can build. Tabular, Summary, Matrix, and Join. Tabular reports are simplest and fastest way to look at data. Similar to a spreadsheet, they consist of an ordered set of fields and columns with each matching record listed in a row. Tabular reports are best for creating lists of records. They can't be used to create groups of data or charts. I would like to pull out a tabular report on the position object 
to figure out how many positions have been created by me in the last three months. To create a report on the custom object, choose other report types and I'll select positions. In case the report type is not available, that means we haven't enabled reporting on that object. Now, I'm on the report builder. I can drag and drop all the fields that I'm interested in. And then apply filters like create a date is between September and December. And show me all the positions that I own. Now I have a report showing how many positions I have created in the last three months. You can even sort the records in ascending or descending order. Once I'm done building the report, I can save the report to a folder and share it with people who need it. When a report is shared with a user and that user does not have access to records due to security settings like organization-wide defaults, then the user will not be able to see the records in that report. Sometimes, you would also like to have a report pulled out every week and emailed to a couple of users. To tackle such requirements, you can schedule a report for future runs. You can select the people that need to get this email and set the frequency for how long you want this report to be scheduled. The running user takes into account all the security settings like organization-wide defaults, sharing rules, manual sharing, and role hierarchy and pulls out only the records that are visible for the running user. The report data can also be exported to a CSV or an Excel file. Let me now talk about a summary report. Summary reports are very similar to tabular reports but also allow users to group rows of data, view subtotals and create charts. They can be used as a source report for dashboard components. This is a report where you can group records by some criteria. For example, I would like to see all the position records grouped by functional area. Let me select the report type as summary report. I can see the drop zone where I can drop the field that I want to group by. Drag functional area into the drop zone. You can see how the records are nicely grouped by the functional area. There are so many records in IT, sales, marketing, etc. You can also do subgrouping if you want. Let me try dropping in the job level into the drop zone. Now, the records are not only grouped but also subgrouped by job level. I used up two levels of grouping. You can go one more level deep. Sometimes, you would also like to group records by salary range. I would like to group the position records into three low level, mid level and high level based on the minimum pay. If the minimum pay is less than 40,000, I would consider low paying, 40 to 70,000 mid level and greater than 70,000 as high level. To tackle this requirement, I can bucket the minimum pay field. Call it pay level and define these three pay levels. Less than 40,000, I'll call it low level, 40 to 70, mid level and greater than 70,000, high level and save this. I can drop the bucket field into the drop zone and you can see how the records are nicely grouped by pay levels. If you are interested in looking at the average pay at every group level, you can choose to display that as well. You can also display sum, min, max and average at every group level. I can even build a chart using the report information. Select the type of chart. It could be horizontal or vertical bar chart, 
pie chart, donut, or even a funnel. I want to see a pie chart display all the position records grouped by the pay level. I can preview the chart and even customize it and save. Summary report is the most popular form of reporting on this platform. In the next lecture, let's talk about matrix and join reports. Matrix reports are very similar to summary reports, but allow you to group and summarize data by both rows and columns. They can be used as a source report for dashboard components. Let's go and build one. Let's start with a clean report on the position object. Change the report format to matrix report. We can now see two drop zones. We can group the records by rows as well as columns. Let me drag the functional area into the drop zone and also the job level. We can see how the positions are grouped by functional area and subgrouped by job level. We can also group records by rows. Let me drag the status and travel required into the drop zone. I can view the positions grouped by status and job levels. For people who are interested in viewing sliced and diced data, a matrix report can be quite helpful. You can also build charts on a matrix report. Join reports let you view different types of information in a single report. It lets you create multiple report blocks that provide different views of your data. For example, we want to see a side-by-side -side comparison of how many positions were closed in the last month by one recruiter and compare that with another. I'll try to create a new report. Let me select the format of a join report. The appearance has changed. The report now displays like a block. In a join report, each block represents a separate view of your data. Let me add filters to this block to show all positions that are closed filled in the month of December and that are owned by recruiter Sam. Let's create a second block. This block will contain positions that are owned by another recruiter. To create a new block, we drag a field to an empty area beside the first block. You will notice the second set of filters. Now drag additional fields to the second block. Let's filter the second block to show only positions that are closed filled in the month of December and that are owned by recruiter Ralph. Right now, the report shows two views of the position data. Common fields that are available for grouping are visible on the left pane. Now, Let's group records by functional area. Finally, we'll add titles to the block to clarify what they are showing. Now, let's run our report to see the summary information only. Click Hide Details. Now, the report looks like a scorecard for each recruiter. Join reports let you view different types of information in a single report. It lets you create multiple report blocks that provide different views of your data. In the next lecture, let's talk about custom report types. You can build reports on multiple objects only if they are related to each other. Using the reporting framework, 
you can build reports on multiple objects like job applications with positions or job applications with candidates or job applications with reviews. These are all available by default because of the relationships between those objects. But what if you need to build a report on more than two objects which are related to each other? You don't have a report type available for that. That is when you can build a custom report type. To create a custom report type, under Create, Report Types, there is this new custom report type. Let's build a report on positions with job applications and reviews. My primary object would be positions. I'll call this report positions with job applications and reviews and reporting on multiple objects. I'll save this in other reports category. Set the deployment status to deployed so that it will be available for use. Let's build a report on positions with job applications and reviews. Now let's go build a new report From other reports, I'll select the report type that we just created. You can now build a report using fields from any of these three objects, positions, job applications, and reviews. Let me drag a couple of fields from all these three objects. You now have a report on positions with job applications and reviews. You can leverage custom report types to build a framework in the report wizard from which users can create and customize reports. A dashboard shows data from source reports as visual components, which can be charts, gauges, tables, metrics, or Visual Force pages. The components provide a snapshot of key metrics and performance indicators for your org. Let's create a dashboard. You can quickly drag and drop a component type onto the dashboard, then power the component by a data source. The data source can be a report or a Visual Force page. Let me drag a pie chart component and select the pay level report as the data source. And let me also drag another component, this time vertical bar graph, and select the matrix report we just built as the data source. I just have two components on the dashboard right now. You can have up to 20. You can also create multiple dashboards and share them with other people in the org. There's an important setting that you need to pay attention to. Run as specified user. The dashboard runs using the security settings of that single specific user. All users with access to the dashboard see the same data regardless of their own personal security settings. This approach is perfect for sharing the big picture across a hierarchy or motivating team members by showing peer performance within a team. Run as logged in user. A dynamic dashboard runs using the security settings of the user viewing the dashboard. Each user sees the dashboard according to his or her own access level. This approach helps administrators share one common set of dashboard components to users with different levels of access. If your reporting needs are not met by the Salesforce platform, we can also export data to other business intelligence tools for analytics. In the next lecture, let's talk about data management tools available on this platform. There are tools on this platform to help you with data management, like exporting data, understanding the storage usage, 
transfer ownership of records and transfer of approval requests or even mass deletion of records. Exporting data. Every organization would like to periodically backup their data. You can use the export wizard from the setup menu, data management, data export. You can initiate the data export by clicking on export. Here, you can select the objects you like to export. And you can also choose to include attachments as well and start the operation. This process might take a while. You'll be notified by an email once the export is complete. You'll see a compressed zip folder that can be downloaded. You can also schedule an export that can periodically run by itself. You can set the frequency, like the first of every month, or the first Monday of every month, a start date, and an end date, and also a preferred time for the export. You can select the objects you like to export. And save. The system would export the data which would be ready for download on the first of every month. To get an overview of the entire organization's storage usage, you can click on this link. It will show you the data storage and file storage limits of your org. You can also get an overview of the objects that are using the most amount of space and also the list of users that are using the highest amount of space. Transfer of ownership. Sometimes you would want to transfer ownership of records from one user to another. For example, when a sales rep is leaving the company, then all the leads that are owned by that sales rep need to be transferred to someone else. In scenarios like those, mass transfer of records can come in handy. For example, I need to transfer all the leads that are owned by me to another user. I can easily do this by using mass transfer records. Let me select transfer leads. I can quickly pull out all the leads that are owned by me and the ones that are not yet converted into accounts. I can select the records and then transfer them to another user. Administration activities like these are done by users with an administrator profile. A normal user would not get access to these tools from the setup menu. Mass transfer of approval requests. In the past, you have learned how to configure an approval process. Sometimes, you might have scenarios where you need to transfer the pending approval requests. For example, when a manager is leaving the company, then all the approval requests that are pending with that person need to be transferred to another user. You can use this tool, Mass Transfer of Approval Requests. Here, we can apply filters to pull out all the pending approval requests and transfer them to another user. Mass deletion of records. Sometimes you might have scenarios where you need to delete few hundreds of records or even more from an object, which might be cumbersome. Salesforce lets you mass delete records from couple of standard objects that are shown here. For example, if you need to delete whole bunch of records in the leads object, then you can click on mass delete leads. 
apply filters for the criteria you are interested in. Select the records and delete them. This will push all the records into the recycle bin. However, if you would like to permanently delete these records, you can select this checkbox. Mass deletion of records will let you work on limited number of standard objects. However, we can use a tool called Data Loader to delete records from any object. I'll talk about the Data Loader tool in the next lecture. Data Loader is a tool that can help you with any kind of data manipulation in your org. You can download the Data Loader from the Setup menu, Data Management, and Data Loader. If you happen to use a Mac, then you can download a tool called Lexi Loader. It is a Mac version of the same tool. Just search for it on the web and you should be able to find it. Let me open the tool. The UI of the data loader is very similar to that of the import wizard. You can use this tool to insert, update, upsert, delete, and even export data. Upsert is combination of both insert and update operations. Since data loader is an external tool, it will connect to Salesforce instance through an API. We always need a security token while accessing the API. How to get one? After login, you can navigate to your personal preferences. And generate a security token. This will be emailed to you. I just received an email with the security token. Just to give you an overview of how to use the data loader, let me insert a couple of records into the candidate object. I have few candidate records in the sample file.csv. To log in, you need to pass in your Salesforce username and password appended with the security token. It would have been easier if it was mentioned somewhere on this tool. I choose to insert records, select the object, select the CSV file, then I can do the mapping. I can use the auto mapping feature. This will quickly map fields on the import file to the candidate object. The system prompts me to choose a location where it will store the log file. I'll save it on the desktop. This file will be useful to debug if something goes wrong during the data load. Looks like the records were successfully inserted. You'll find the same in the log file. I also want to show you how to delete records using this tool. I'll try to delete the same set of records that I've just inserted. To delete records, you need to first export the records that you want to delete to a CSV file. Records from the candidate object. I'll call this export.csv. Apply the filters for the data that needs to be exported. I'll choose created date equals current date and export them. As I mentioned earlier, the data loader always gives out an 18 digit ID. Now, to delete records, I can click on delete 
show the path to the file that contains IDs for all the records that need to be deleted. Then I can do the mapping. All done. I was able to easily insert and delete records using this tool. This tool really comes in handy for any data manipulation activity. Salesforce supports multiple languages. All of the setup menu, the standard functionality that is provided out of the box, like the sales, call center, marketing, is automatically available in the supported languages. Multilingual support is especially useful when you have users from different geographies. Though the platform officially supports multiple languages, when we build anything custom, field labels, validation error messages, or even custom object tabs, we can use the translation workbench to translate our customizations to other languages. To enable the translation workbench, you can go to Setup, Translation Workbench, Translation Settings, and enable. You can choose the language you wish to add and identify translators for this language. These are all the languages that are officially supported by Salesforce. I'll choose Spanish and add myself as a translator and save it. Now I can go to the translate section Select the component that I wish to translate. Right now, I want to translate this custom app called Recruiting to Spanish. In Spanish, it is called Reclutamiento. I can put this in and save. I want to translate the field labels in the position object. I can do so by selecting the custom fields on the position object. I did translate all these to Spanish. Sometimes, if you need to translate the entire application, you might want to take help of a language translator. We can also export the untranslated file, give it to a translator, and once the translation is complete, you can import the translated file back into the system. There is also a tip sheet that can come in handy during the process. For users that need to access the application in a different language, you can go to the user account and select the appropriate language for them. When these users log in, they'll be able to see the application in the appropriate language. So, using multi-language support and the translation workbench, you can support users from multiple geographies. When you want to customize the UI and you find limitations using the declarative syntax, that's when you can use Visual Force. Visual Force is a tag-based language that is similar to HTML. It is proprietary of Salesforce and like HTML, Visual Force pages run on any device that has a web browser installed. You can control the UI at a pixel level detail. And Visual Force pages are executed at the server. Here is a side by side comparison of a page that says Hello World in HTML and Visual Force. Visual Force pages are ultimately rendered into a markup. This means the developers can include Visual Force tags, force.com expressions, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Flash, or any code that can execute within a HTML page. There are a couple of benefits using it. Visual Force understands Salesforce metadata 
and provides access to respective UI elements. For example, it automatically adds a calendar dropdown for data entry fields when you have a date field. If you were to build this using HTML and JavaScript, you need a complete library for the calendar functionality itself. Here, the framework takes care of it. Visual Force pages are hosted by Salesforce and they are tightly coupled with the salesforce.com platform. Because of this, Visual Force pages display same performance as of standard Salesforce pages. And most of the time, recreate Salesforce standard look and feel. You can have an inline editor which renders the UI as you build it. It conforms to the model view controller architecture. Model is business data and the rules on how to use data. View is the UI. Controller is the logic that manages the interaction between the view and model. Here I have a sample Visual Force page. I want to show you what tags correspond to what elements. Every page starts with an Apex page tag. Inside we have a page block and a table couple of columns and an enhanced list. In the next lecture, I'll get you started on building our first Visual Force page. There's a requirement where all the positions that are open and approved should be listed on a page and that should be accessible for anyone on the web. This page acts as a career portal for the company. To tackle this requirement, we can build a Visual Force page to display all the open approved positions in the company and then create a force.com site and link this Visual Force page to it. Let's go create our Visual Force page to display all the positions that are open approved. To create a Visual Force page, I can go to Develop, Pages and New Visual Force page. I can give it a name and use this place to write code. I prefer to use the inline editor where you can see how the code behaves while you build your Visual Force page. To be able to use the inline editor, I need to set myself up in the development mode. I can go to manage users, edit my account and set myself up in development mode. and save it. In the browser, clear all the text up to .com and then type in slash apex slash the name of the Visual Force page you want to create. I would like to call this page careers. This page does not exist yet. This link below will let you create this page. If you are not able to see this link, it means you haven't set yourself up in development mode. Now, I have the Visual Force page and on the bottom of the screen, you have the inline editor. I can expand the window. Let me quickly make few changes. and save this. You can see in real time how the page looks like. This is the advantage of using the inline editor. Let me clear off everything and also remove the header and the sidebar. In the apex page tag, I'll pass in this attributes, show header, it takes a boolean value, false, and even the sidebar as false. I would like to display records from the position object. I need a controller to help me fetch records from the object. 
I can use the standard controller called position. Every object has a standard controller available. The name of the controller is same as the name of the object. I'll use the variable name positions to address the records that are fetched using the controller. Record set var equals positions and save it. Now I have a clean page to start with. Let me start with a page block and a heading Welcome to Career Portal of Universal Containers. I'll use a paragraph tag. We are a fast growing company. To stay ahead, we are currently seeking bright and talented folks to join our company. Browser open positions below and email your resume to apply. Let me save this. Now, I'll use a page block table to display position records. Apex, page block table, value equals positions. And each record in this group is called with a variable name, position. And let's create a couple of columns starting with position title. Apex column value equals position dot name. Let me quickly open the position object. I want you to notice that name is the field name for the position title. Let me create another column with location. Apex column value equals position dot location and job description. And status as well. Let me save this. You can see all the position records, including the ones that are closed filled. And also closed cancelled. We wanted to display only positions that are open approved. To tackle that, you can go to this column and pass in an attribute called rendered, which takes in a boolean value. If you pass in true, it would render the column. If you pass in false, it wouldn't. Instead of passing true or false, I can use an expression. If status equals open approved, then true, otherwise false. I can pass the rendered attribute to all the columns and save it. Now you can see that there are only positions that are open approved. We have used couple of Visual Force tags to build this page. To understand the different tags and this syntax, you can click on the component reference. This is a library for Visual Force components. If you can recollect, we have used Apex page. You have a nice description of this tag and all the attributes that can be used inside this tag. We have used attributes like record set var, rendered, sidebar, show header, and also standard controller. There is a nice explanation for each and every attribute. You also have some help on the tag usage and its syntax. At any point, 
If you have questions about a Visual Force tag or their syntax, you can use this library as a reference. In the next lecture, I'll show you how to create a force.com site and link it to the Visual Force page that we just created. We have built a Visual Force page that displays all the positions that are open approved. We just need to create a site and link it to the Visual Force page. This site can be a career portal that displays all the open positions in the company for anyone across the world. To create a site, you can navigate to Develop and Sites. You get to choose a name for the site. This would be a subdomain of force.com. I'll just try to look up this name Universal Containers Job Portal. I'll cut it short UC Job Portal. Looks like it's available. I agree to the terms and register my subdomain. I'll call this site a job portal. This site displays all the open approved positions in the company. Make this site active. Link this site to the Visual Force page that we created. I can choose to upload a Fevicon. Track the site visits by using Google Analytics. I don't really need any of that right now. Let me save this. I also need to configure the public access settings for the site. I want to make sure that anyone can see all the records on the site. I can do that by giving view all data access. And saving this. Let me click on the site to see if it works. Anyone can see all the open approved positions in the company from this site. The best part, no one needs to update this site. As soon as a position status changes from open approved to something else, it is no longer shown here. It kind of updates itself. If you need to, there is Visual Force page code in the attachment. Let me talk about an example where we can use a Visual Force page to improve the user experience. You have five applications for this position where a couple of them have to be scheduled for an interview. So the user needs to update the status of job application to schedule for an interview. With the current UI we have, we can update the status of only one application at a time. What if we needed a better UI to update multiple job applications at once? Let me show you how we can leverage Visual Force to tackle this. I could have checkboxes for record selection and a button to update the status. And when you click on the button, you can be routed to another page with the records that are selected and a drop down with the status pick list where you can update the status and save. Once you click on save, you are routed back to the position page layout where you can see the updated status of job applications. Let us first build the Visual Force page. We shall later link it with a button and place the button on the page layout. To create a Visual Force page, I can clear off everything up to .com and slash apex slash name of the page. Since this page is used to mass update records, I'll call this mass update. Now we have a blank Visual Force page. I can use the inline editor to build the Visual Force page. This page will be used to mass update job applications. So, we need to use the job application controller 
to help us fetch records. Let me remove the header and the sidebar and call the record set variable as applications. All the records that are fetched using this controller are called with this variable name applications. I'll create a section header, give it a title, mass update status of job applications, the user inputs like status pick list and the save and cancel buttons have to be enclosed within a form tag. Apex form and also let's create a page block and a page block section inside with some title. Within this section, let's create the save button. We can use the apex command button to display save and when the user clicks on this button, invoke the save action. This action is defined in the job application controller. Let me create another button to display cancel and when the user clicks on it, invoke the cancel action which is also defined in the controller. Let's place the status pick list by using the apex input field value. Let me create another section, give it a title, selected applications. Also, we need a table that will render the selected job applications. We can use apex page block table value as selected. This table will be rendering applications that are selected on the page layout and each record is addressed with a variable name application. I would like to display some columns, the job application number, the name of the candidate, the position they have applied to and the status of job application. Let's start with the job application number. Apex column value equals application dot name and another column with the candidate name and also the position title and status of the application. Let's save this. Looks like this section is collapsible. We can prevent the section from collapsing by passing in the attribute collapsible equals false. And also, Looks like the table is not taking up the entire width. Maybe I can pass in an attribute. Columns equal 1. Now the table takes up the entire width. The buttons don't seem to be centered or aligned. We can wrap both these buttons inside another tag called Apex Page Block Buttons. This looks much better. And one more thing since it's a Visual Force page, in case the user did not make a valid selection or a validation rule preventing the user from saving a record, we need a way to display the system error messages. This tag, Apex Page Messages, can take care of that. We now have a standalone Visual Force page called Mass Update. 
let's link it to a button. We can create a button from the job applications object, navigate to buttons and links, create a custom button and give it a name. I'll call this update status. I would like to make a list button and also have checkboxes for record selection and link it to the Visual Force page that we just created. You will understand in a moment what I mean by having checkboxes for record selection. We have the update status button which is not placed anywhere yet. It would make sense to place it above the job applications related list on the position page layout, right here. You can edit the layout in the related list Add the button and save. Let me open the position record which has couple of applicants. I would like to update the status of these three applications to schedule for phone interview. I can select multiple records at once and update status. I'm now routed to the mass update Visual Force page where you can see the selected applications. I can update the status to schedule for a phone interview and save. I'm routed back to the position page layout and you can see the status updated for all these three applications. This is much easier than updating one record at a time. So, this Visual Force page lets you update the status of multiple applications with fewer clicks and improving the user experience. Let's talk about the different types of environments. The developer environment is the one that you currently have access to. You have access to all the tools to build your application and test it out. However, you have limitations in the amount of space available. You cannot use this account as a production environment. You would have to purchase licenses from Salesforce to get access to production and sandbox environments. In real time, the end users of the application would be using the production. Whenever there is a requirement to build new functionality, you wouldn't want to disturb the users by building the new functionality in production. Instead, you can use a sandbox. Sandboxes give you the ability to create multiple copies of your organization in separate environments for a variety of purposes such as development, training, testing, and deployments. When you create a sandbox, Salesforce automatically copies your data from production to a sandbox. You can use it for development. Once the development is complete, move the metadata to another sandbox for QA, and then move it to production. There are different kinds of sandboxes. Developer, Developer Pro, Partial Copy, and Full Copy. A developer sandbox can be used for coding or testing. Developer Pro sandbox can also be used for coding and testing, but have larger storage limit than developer sandboxes have, which allows for more robust test datasets. Partial Copy sandboxes are mostly used as testing environments. These environments can be used for quality assurance tasks such as integration testing and training. They can have a subset of your production data. Full copy sandboxes are intended to be used as testing environments. These environments are the only ones that can support full performance testing and load testing. These environments are a replica of your production org, including all data. Based on your business requirements, you can purchase licenses for your sandboxes. 
This table shows the limitations for different kinds of sandboxes. A developer sandbox can be refreshed every day and has 200 MB of data and file storage limits. Since it has a small storage limit, it is mainly used to copy metadata. A developer pro sandbox, however, can be refreshed every day and has a higher storage limit of 1 GB. You can only copy metadata here as well. A partial copy sandbox can be refreshed every 5 days and has a storage limit of 1 GB. You can copy metadata and object data, which are your records. Full copy sandbox can be refreshed every 29 days. The storage limit is same as the production instance and you can copy the entire metadata and object data from production. In the next lecture, let's talk about deployments. Deployment is the process of moving metadata from one environment to the other. To move metadata from one sandbox to another, you can use the chain sets or the force.com IDE or the force.com migration tool. Chain set is a means by which you can send customizations from one org to another. Chain sets can only contain modifications you can make through the setup menu. Chain sets may contain customizations to existing components or new components but can't be used to delete or rename components. To move metadata using chain sets, you need to have connection between the two environments which can be configured from deployment connections. An outbound chain set is a chain set created in the org you are logged into and want to send it to another organization. An inbound chain set is a chain set that has been sent from another org to the organization you are logged into. This deploy section is not available in your developer instance. I have access to a production and sandbox environment of a company. I can show you a couple of tools in the deployment section. Let me quickly log into a sandbox. The login URL for a sandbox would be test.salesforce.com There's a small warehouse application that includes a tab and a custom object. With testing completed, it's time for the administrator Aaron to move all the components from sandbox to production using chain sets. Chain sets are point and click tool to move configuration changes from one org to another. In this case, from sandbox to production. We logged into production org as Aaron. So let's start by authorizing a deployment connection from sandbox to production org. Deployment connections are automatically created between related organizations when a sandbox is created. But organizations can't send or receive chain sets until the connection between them has been authorized. From setup, search for deployment connections and click on edit beside the sandbox connection. To allow sandbox to deploy chain sets to production org, we select allow inbound changes and save. Now let's log in as Aaron to the sandbox and create an outbound chain set. From the setup menu, under deploy, select outbound chain sets, new. We'll enter a name to help us identify the chain set and description of the changes it contains. Now let's add the new components to the chain set. We created an application and custom object and a tab. So we can use the drop down list to search for those components and add them to the chain set. We need to repeat this for each type of component. As you can see, we just added our three components. Sometimes you will create components that can be dependent on others. You can add all the dependent components easily. You can click view, add dependencies, select all the dependent components and add them to the chain set. Once you're done adding the components, you can upload the chain set. Let me select the production arc. This might take a while to upload. 
you will be notified by an email once the upload is complete. Meanwhile, let's switch to the production org. An outbound chain set from another org appears as an inbound chain set in this org. From setup, let's navigate to inbound chain sets using search. You can see that the chain set is waiting for us. We can validate the new components in production to simulate the deployment and catch any potential errors. In this case, everything works as expected. So we are ready to commit the changes to production. We click deploy and then OK in the pop-up. After the changes are deployed, we can see the application from the app picker. When you move permission sets from sandbox to production, you have to manually assign those permission sets to the user in the production org. In the next lecture, let's talk about the force.com IDE. We have an integrated development platform called force.com IDE that you can install on your desktop. This tool can be handy when you want to write any code, like creating Visual Force pages or Apex classes or quickly run some SOQL queries. You can search for the force.com IDE and follow the installation steps. You may run into some issues if you don't have the correct version of Java installed. But there is some nice documentation to help you resolve them. I have the IDE installed on my machine. Let me open it. Using the IDE, I can connect to my Salesforce instance and download all the metadata. Let me give this project a name, pass in my credentials along with the security token. I'm now connecting to my developer instance. I can download the entire metadata, but I choose to download only the code like classes, pages, and triggers. It takes a little while. The metadata is downloaded onto my local machine. If you expand the SRC folder, you can see the downloaded metadata like Visual Force pages that we created in the past, the careers page and the mass update. I can even make changes to these Visual Force pages and sync them with the cloud. Let me comment these two lines. And save it. By just right clicking the file. Force.com. And save to server. Let me quickly open the Visual Force page from the browser. And you can see that the changes are updated here as well. If you like to, you can create Visual Force pages, classes, or triggers right from here. I can also run queries on any object from the Salesforce schema. Just to try out, let me quickly query all the records in the candidate object. All I need to do is select the fields I'm interested in. And the query gets constructed on the fly. This can come in handy when you're writing code. You can also use the force.com IDE to move metadata from one environment to another. 
Currently, we just have a developer org. But in real time, you want to migrate your application metadata from one sandbox to another or from sandbox to production. For example, you built a Visual Force page in the sandbox and you quickly want to migrate that to another sandbox environment. You can simply select the metadata, right click, force.com, deploy to server, and pass in the credentials of your target sandbox. And then click on Finish. This would have copied the Visual Force page to the target instance. You can use the force.com IDE primarily to write code, run some SOQL queries, and also quickly deploy metadata from one instance of Salesforce to another. I suggest you install and play around with this tool to get a hang of it. Salesforce has a nice App Exchange Marketplace. To access the marketplace, you can click on App Exchange Marketplace link under the Build section. Any developer could build an app and publish it on App Exchange. It is like App Store for apps that run on the Salesforce platform. The developer can choose to make the app free or paid. As you can see, there are apps in various domains like sales, marketing, IT, ERP, and even collaboration. Let me quickly search for an app on the lines of project management. As you can see, there are a whole bunch of apps and some of them with a lot of reviews even. Let me check out this app, TaskRay, for project management. Looks like it has some nice reviews. It costs $19 per user per month. You can try the app before buying. Most of them offer a trial period as well. To understand how it works, there is a video and also a couple of screenshots of the app. Let me install the app on my Salesforce instance. They have a free trial for 14 days. I agree to the terms and install it for all users. This installation might take a while. Let me refresh the page. Looks like the app is installed. I can go run the app. Looks like there is a step-by-step -step guide on how to use it. You can now use this app for project management. The point is, when you have a requirement for an application, you don't have to start building one. You can check out the app exchange if something works for you, install and try it out. If you don't like it, uninstalling is also pretty straightforward. You can click on uninstall and there it goes. You can also access Salesforce applications from a mobile device. Salesforce One is a brand new way to experience Chatter, CRM and custom apps in a unified way from any device. There's an app for both Android and iPhones. Install the app and try playing around. There's one more app called Salesforce A that I want you to install and explore. This app is quite useful for Salesforce admins. Admins can use it to edit, unlock, freeze, and deactivate user accounts, reset passwords, and assign permission sets. Try to install the app and explore it. There are a couple of useful plugins that you can install for Chrome browser. Sandbox Fevicon extension, in real time, you might have to log into Sandbox and production instances at the same time. You will soon have quite a few tabs open and hard to distinguish which tab corresponds to Sandbox and which one to production. This simple extension will add a small S over the Cloud Fevicon in your browser's tab. This makes switching between tabs incredibly simple. Another one, Force.com Logins. If you have to constantly switch between environments, developer, sandbox, and production, it would be nice to have those logins 
stored away in an easy to use location. This extension will allow you to save and group together all your Salesforce login info and make logging into an instance a single click process. Let me talk about another extension. This force.com utility belt is jam packed with different Salesforce functionality. Using this extension, you can quickly access Salesforce documentation, search against specific Salesforce sites, and even convert IDs from 15 to 18 digits. You'll find links to download these extensions in the resources. Every record is identified by a unique ID, which is called salesforce.com ID. They exist in two different forms, 15-digit case-sensitive form and 18-digit case-insensitive form. There are three ways you can find the ID of a record. You can open the record and see the ID in the browser, or you can run a report, or you can even export the data using the data loader tool. The first two options give out a 15-digit ID, and the data loader always gives out an 18-digit ID. Let me quickly open some random record. This is the 15-digit case-sensitive ID of this record. When you export this record using the data loader, it gives out an 18-digit ID, which is case-insensitive. It is the same ID in two different forms. I would like to make a small note here. The data loader tool accepts record IDs in 15-digit and 18-digit format. If you need to, you can also convert a 15-digit ID to an 18-digit using a tool, which is available as a Chrome plugin. You might not really need this, but if you need to, here is a URL. When you need information about your Salesforce instance, maintenance issues, or downtimes, you can go to trust.salesforce.com. It's a Salesforce community's homepage for real-time information on system performance and security. There's a live and historical data on system performance and also up-to-the-minute information on planned maintenance. You can see the system status for North America instances, Asia-Pacific, Europe, Middle East, Africa instances, and also your sandbox instances. We can see if there are any performance issues or service disruption. Look at the URL to find out what instance you are using. And then add all the instances of your org. This is like a snapshot. This would be your go to location for maintenance issues or downtimes. There is also a place for exchange of ideas for Salesforce community. That is ideas.salesforce.com. Here, you can suggest new features, vote and comment on favorite ideas. Ideas with highest number of votes would be considered for development in new releases of Salesforce. Once you're comfortable with the concepts discussed in this course and you have completed all the assignments and quizzes, you should be able to take the DEV 401 certification exam. The exam has multiple choice questions. You need to get 68% to pass. To sign up for the exam or find out the nearest testing center in your city, you can log into this URL. Once you're through DEV 401, you can move on to learning the concepts of DEV 501. In DEV 501, you'll learn Apex and Visual Force. To check out opportunities for a Salesforce developer, explore this URL jobs.businessweek.com Salesforce and uh, if you have any questions, post them in the discussion board.